Uh, good morning, Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Nigerian Society of Engineers Abuja Branch, I'm most delighted to very warmly welcome you all to this auspicious gathering this morning, the 2024 Engineering Week of the Nigerian Society of Engineers Abuja Branch. We're most delighted to have you all here with us this morning. Welcome. Uh, on that note, I would like to humbly request that we officially begin this program with the national anthem. May we all rise, please. While we remain standing, we'll take the opening prayer, the third stanza of the new national anthem. Together we pray, O God of creation, grant this our one request. Help us to build a nation where no man is oppressed. And so with peace and plenty, Nigeria may be blessed. Amen. You may kindly be seated, please. The chairman of this occasion, the president of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Engineer Margaret Aino Oguntala FNSC, ably represented here this morning by His Royalty, Engineer Otis Oliver Anyeji, Fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Fellow Academy of Engineering, a past president of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, a special guest of honor, an executive governor of Enugu State, his Excellency, Barista Peter Undubisi Umba, ably presented here this morning by Mr. Ajogu Sunday Emeka, Commissioner Special Duties, Enugu State, our guest of honor and president of the Council for the Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria in Absentia, Engineer Professor Sedik Zubair Abubakar, Fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Fellow Academy of Engineering. The guest speaker of this auspicious gathering this morning, Engineer Sadiq A. Mayborunu. Our host, the Honorable Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Barista Yesom E. Wike, C.O.N. Uh, our host, the Chairman of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Abuja Branch, Engineer Ben O. C. Oko. Fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Fellow American Society of Civil Engineers, Engineer Isaac Namdi Anum, Director of Bioresources and Technology, representing the Honorable Minister of Innovation, Science, and Technology, Engineer Abraham Oshadami, MNSC representing the Executive Vice Chairman of the Nigerian Co uh, Communications Commission, Engineer Francis A. Ogari, Executive Director from the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority, Mr. Emmanuel Mark Jaja, 
Head Development and Production, NUPRC, representing the CCE NUPRC. Engineer George Amara, PhD, MNSC, our moderator for today's panel discussion. Engineer Dr. Nuru Yakubu, FNSC, Fellow Academy of Engineering, OON, a former Executive Secretary, NBTE, a former National Commissioner, INEC, former Rector, Katpoli. Engineer Dr. Emeka Agbasi, PhD, FNSC, the MD and Chief Executive Officer of FEMA. The Chairman, Nigerian Institute of Architects, Abuja, Architect Yemi, Shola, Adebi, FNIA. The Vice Chairman of Nigerian Institute of Architect, uh, Architect Ehi Asain. Executive Committee members of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Abuja Branch, past presidents of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, elders, fellows of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Chapter Chairman of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Branch and Divisional Chairman of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, our eminent speakers and presenters, members of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, friends and invited guests, gentlemen of the press, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Chairman of this all-important occasion, and our host, the Chairman of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Abuja Branch, it is my absolute delight to very warmly welcome you, Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to the opening ceremony of the 2024 Engineering Week and Annual General Meeting of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Abuja Branch. The NSC Abuja Branch is the pioneer branch of the NSC in FCT, saddled with the responsibility of ensuring the enhancement of professional practice and competence of members through meetings, technical presentations, workshops, exhibitions, symposia, and industrial visits. The AGM is a forum in the society's annual calendar during which members meet to address topical issues and take vital decisions to reposition the NSC Abuja branch for the immediate and future opportunities in the economy of nations. It's a week-long program that promotes networking, enlightening interactions between members, technocrats, stakeholders in the engineering profession. Each year, a theme is carefully chosen to enable attendees to derive tangible and focused benefits from the keynote address, presentations from various seasoned speakers of the plenary sessions, as well as technical session at this event. The theme for this year's event, like we all know, is the role of engineering in energy transition, a theme that underscores the pivotal role that engineering plays in transitioning from fossil-based to zero-carbon renewable energy sources. Other highlights of this event include a novelty match, dinner, and award night. I'd like for everyone to turn to their neighbors on that note, both to your left and to your right, and welcome them very warmly with a smile. If you're not smiling, you're wrong. Welcome them with a smile. Thank them for finding time to be part of this event this morning. If your neighbor did not smile at you, please wave at me and let me know so that I can query them. Please smile at your neighbor and welcome him very warmly. Thank you everyone for coming. We are most delighted to have you here with us this morning. My name is Faith Oche and I'm honored and delighted as always to be the director of programs for today's event. A round of applause for yourselves, please. And another round of applause for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And so to officially welcome this gathering, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute pleasure to invite up to the podium for his welcome address, 
our very distinguished and indefatigable chairman of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Abuja Branch, an astute and avid professional engineer, an epitome of commitment, hard work, and loyalty, one whose love for the engineering profession is palpable and profound, an engineer per excellence. A round of applause as a welcome, engineer Ben Osi Oko, fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, fellow American Society of Civil Engineers. If you love him, please, you can applaud him better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Director of Programs, Faith Oche, for that wonderful introductory remarks. I think I have to stand on the established protocol, but permit me to specially acknowledge the presence of the special guest of honor for this event, an executive governor of Enugu State, my own governor, Barista Peter Ndubisi Mba, who is ably represented by the Commissioner for Special Duties, Enugu State, my brother, Ajogu Sunday Emeka. You're welcome, sir. It's also my honor to especially acknowledge the presence of the chairman of this august occasion, past president of the Nigerian Site of Engineers and past president of the Federation of West African Federation of Engineering Organizations, His Royalty, Engineer Otis Oliver. Tabubo Anyeji, Ubiono Wu, Tuno Keja, fellow of the Nigerian Site of Engineers and fellow of the Academy of Engineering. I know when the MC was doing the introduction, he was not here, and I have to do that. My Oga, the immediate past executive secretary of the Federal Capital Development Authority and past chairman of this great branch, engineer Omar Gamboji Brin, fellow of the Nigerian Site of Engineers, and a recipient of the National Honor of Officer of the Order of the Niger. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> and finally, I will also acknowledge the presence of the guest speaker for today's event, my friend, my boss, I, I think I, if there's anybody I worry this year, <laughs> I was on his matter for more than God knows. And we finally got here. Engineer Sadiq Maibonu, you're welcome, sir. You're welcome. It's my pleasure to have you and the moderators, the members of the panel. And I was also on their matter until we got here. Engineer George and Dayo and Jinia Musa, you are all welcome. Finally, I have to respectfully acknowledge, you know, in FCT we have a committee of professional bodies in the real, um, the built environment. And I have my very big sister and colleague, architect, Shola Adebi, who is the chairman of the Nigerian Institute of Architects, Abuja chapter. And others are coming. We have the town planners. We have the, all the professionals in the built environment. I know before the end of this program, they are going to be here. And all the special guests who are here present, I don't want to repeat what the MC has already said. Let me, on that note, stand strongly on that previously established protocol. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome address by engineer Ben O.C. Oko, FNSC, the chairman of the Nigerian Society of Engineers Abuja branch on the occasion of the opening ceremony of the 2024 Engineering Week and annual general meeting of the branch. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Executive Committee of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Abuja Branch, I am honored to welcome you to the opening ceremony of the 2024 Engineering Week and Annual General Meeting of our great branch. 
the Nigerian site of engineers Abuja brand, the Primus Enterprise. We proudly say that because that is what we are and that is what we represent. This year's team, the role of engineering in energy transition is timely and critical, and, and critical reflection of our collective commitment to exploring innovative solutions for a sustainable future. As the world grapples with the pressing need to transition to cleaner energy sources, engineering stands at the forefront of driving this transformation. The challenges and the opportunities presented by this transition are immense, and our role as engineers in shaping this future cannot be overemphasized. We are privileged to have as our guest speaker, Engineer Sadiq A. Maibonu, a project advisor at UTM FLNG and former deputy managing director of NLNG. His extensive experience in the energy sector and his deep understanding of the intricacies involved in the global energy transition will provide us with invaluable insights. Engineer Mai Bonu's discourse on the pivotal role of engineering in this transition promises to be both enlightening and thought-provoking. In addition to the guest speaker's presentation, we are excited to present a robust panel discussion covering essential sub-themes related to energy transition. The session, which will be moderated by engineer Dr. George Amara, MNSC Project and Technical Director, UTM, FLNG, we feature other distinguished panelists, such as Dio Adeshina, Project Coordinator, IOGC, and former Special Senior Advice Assistant on Gas to Nigerians, to Nigerians Vice President, and engineer Musa Joseph, MNSC, Director of Gas, Development and Operations, NMDPRA, among others. The sub-teams, including power deployment, smart grid, and intelligent network in Nigeria, engineering challenges and opportunities in the transition to green energy, innovations in CNG and natural gas, we allow us to delve deep into multifaceted aspects of energy transition and its implications for Nigeria. This year's Engineering Week has been meticulously designed to offer a blend of professional development, community engagement, and celebration of engineering excellence. The event kicked off yesterday with a media chat and a visit. The media chat was at Capital FM and also a visit to the orphanage homes and IDPs, followed by chairman's cocktail party and grand commissioning of our brand new branch secretariat, which took place yesterday at our new secretariat. Immediately after this opening ceremony, we shall be proceeding to LEA Primary School, Durumi, for the commissioning of a block of four units of toilets constructed by the branch as part of our corporate social responsibilities and community engineering programs. The day will be rounded off with a novelty match at Area 3 Sports Complex, Gariki 1, Abuja, Gariki, Gariki Abuja, Gariki 1, actually, Gariki 1, Abuja, in line with our commitment to promoting physical fitness and team spirit. On Wednesday, we will come together for a dinner and award night to honor outstanding contributions to the engineering profession. And on Thursday, we will conclude with our annual general meeting, a vital section for reflecting on our achievements and planning for the future. The formal handing over ceremony to the new executive committee will take place on Friday at the branch secretariat. I encourage all of you and all our members and invited guests to actively participate in this event. Your involvement is crucial to the success of our programs and the growth of our branch and the advancement of our profession. Finally, 
I extend my heartfelt gratitude to the chairman of this event and president of the Nigerian Site of Engineers, Engineer Margaret Aino Oguntala FNSC, ably represented by his royalty, Engineer Otis Oliver Tabubo Anyeji, past president of the Nigerian Site of Engineers. I also want to especially thank the guest, the special guest of honor and governor of Enugu State, His Excellency Dr. Peter Ndubisi Mba, who is also ably represented by the Commissioner for Special Duties, Enugu State. Also, we are expecting, I spoke with the Korean President, who is the guest of honor. He told me that he will soon be arriving for this event. I thank them for accepting these roles and honoring us with their presence. I'm grateful to our members and all individuals and organizations that supported us in this program. God will bless you immensely. Special thanks to the members of the Executive Committee and Planning Committee for, the, for their commitment to the success of this program. Once again, I say a very big thank you to all of you and say may God bless you all. Sign, Engineer Ben O.C. Oko, Chairman, Nigerian Site of Engineers, Abuja Branch. Thank you and God bless you. Can we please give him a more befitting round of applause? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Please applaud him once again as he takes his seat. <laughs> Moving on, Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor and privilege to welcome up for his opening remarks the Chairman of the Nigerian Society of Engineers and 34th President of NSC, Engineer Margaret Aina Oguntala, ably represented here this morning by his royalty. Engineer Otis Oliver Anyedi, Fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Fellow Academy of Engineering, and past president of the Nigerian Society of Engineers. A round of applause for him, please. Can we keep the applause coming until he comes to the fore? Thank you. Thank you, the wonderful master of ceremonies. The chairman, Nigerian Society of Engineers, <coughs> Abuja Branch. The executive governor, Enugu State ably represented by the Commissioner for Special Duties, the guest uh, speaker, former MD NLNG, the former Executive Secretary, FCDA, and past chairman, Nigerian Society of Engineers, Abuja Branch, engineer UG Gibrin, O -O -N. The managing director of FEMA, Dr. Ifani Abbasi, PhD FNSC. I might uh, fail in um, getting the names of every other person on the front seat, but uh, just um, understand with me, I actually came here to sneak in and out, but uh, the president directed that I have to represent her. She is busy uh, somewhere, much as she would have liked to come and uh, be physically you know, here with us in this opening ceremony. She couldn't um, split and uh, come in time. So I have to stand in for her. Um, 
the, ah, I can see the former two past presidents of Apwen, or is it one I'm seeing? There we are two. <laughs> Dr. Ini Soro is here, I can see. But I thought I saw a very well. Okay, she's over there. Past, I uh, can see the representative of Africa in the World Council of uh, Civil Engineers, engineer Dr. Aisha Omar, FNSC. I can see General and uh, many others. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, fellows and members of the Nigerian Society of Engineers. I will begin this task by saying my personal remarks first, and then I will talk on behalf of uh, the president. And uh, my personal remarks will start by way of complimenting the chairman of the branch and the branch, Abuja branch, for all the waves they have been making in the past uh, two years, actually is a continuation because uh, it seems <laughs> the branch has been making waves right from the beginning, as the president would say. Um, and uh, particularly, I believe that uh, Ben has brought his uh, magic wand, uh, the kind of touch he places on everything else he does on this assignment, that even the predeceased pioneer chairman of the branch and the immediate past chairman of the branch would be smiling enjoyably at this worthy success of theirs in whom they are certainly pleased. And I would like us to just stand for uh, a minute in memory of the immediate past chairman of this branch, um, engineer Abdul Malik. Please, can we just stand and uh, May his soul rest in peace. Now, the president asked me to applaud the great strides that uh, the Abuja branch of the society has made in the past two years under the watchful guide of uh, Engineer Ben O.C. Oko. He, she indeed says it is not surprising because uh, they started like that right from the beginning when an assemblage of some of the best engineers this country has produced that we are busy developing what was the biggest construction site on earth. And since then, the president observed they kind of overtook Lagos in terms of impact as a branch of the society and had uh, dominated that until colleagues like her and uh, you know some other colleagues uh, took up the gauntlet from the Keja branch and started giving Abuja a chase for their money. And the president says she 
admires that mutual competition of Abuja taking first place sometimes and the Kaja taking place as uh, taking first place at other times, and uh, all leading to great growth, and observes that when Abuja was split. What was expected there was that it was going to be, become smaller, more or less. But it appeared that each time it gave birth to a new branch, it gets bigger. And uh, this uh, kind of uh, growth in mutation is uh, some lesson that Abuja has to document and pass on to other people so that they will learn how to increase by multiplying and dividing. She will be part of some other activities that uh, the branch will be on during this uh, uh, period. And he um, wishes that uh, we all enjoy the lecture which she takes particular notice of in terms of the diverse nature of the content of that lecture, which addresses the interest of virtually all engineers. And notes that Abuja is used to bringing together all the chapters under her to work together and uh, distill the best that uh, you know, could be got from the combining efforts of the different disciplines of our profession. And so on that note, she has asked me to declare this engineering week open. So I thank you all for listening. Can we applaud him better, please? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. A round of applause for him, please. Thank you. Please let's applaud the chairman once again as he takes his seat. Thank you very much, sir. Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, time now to listen to our guest speaker lead us in a compelling discourse on the theme for this event, which is the role of engineering in energy transition. With a resounding applause, Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let's together welcome our guest speaker, Engineer Sadiq A. Mayburno, as he comes up stage. Can we keep applauding him until he gets here? Thank you very much, sir. I'm going to quickly run through his citation. Sadiq A. Mayburno, MNSC, was Deputy Managing Director of the Nigerian LNG between April 2016 and April 2022. In that capacity, he served as a Director on the Board of Nigeria LNG Limited and its subsidiaries, Bonigas Transport, BGT, and L LNG Ship Management Limited, 
where he was vice chairman. During his six years stint at NLNG, he contributed to the feed and takeoff of the Train 7 projects during the challenging period of COVID-19 pandemic. Completion, commissioning of the new NLNG head office complex in Port Harcourt, as well as championing its realigning to win transformation program. He was also the decision executive on the Bonnie Bodo Road project, which was being executed under the Executive Order 007. Sadiq retired from the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation in April 2022 after serving meritoriously for almost 35 years. Please give him a round of applause. It is indeed a blessing to start and finish. Applaud him once again. Thank you. He is an alumnus of Amadou Bello University, Zaria, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in civil engineering in 1983. He is a member of the Nigerian Society of Engineers and a chartered engineer with the Council for the Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria. In June 2022, he joined UTM FLNG Limited as project advisor, helping to develop the first floating LNG facility in Nigeria. He began his working career in July 1985 at the Ajaokuta Steel Company Limited in present day Kogi State as a pupil engineer in the real estate development department responsible for the construction of the 10,000 housing unit steel township. He joined NNPC in 1987 as a project engineer and served as member of many project teams such as NNPC Corporate Telecoms Network, PPMC Excravos Tanks Farm and Butas Butanization Project for the construction of the nine LPG storage depots nationwide. From 1996 to 2004, Mr. Mayburno served as technical assistant to five consecutive group, group, group general managers in engineering and technology division, where he was renowned for his passion for project management, exemplary leadership, and drive. He was the project management theme lead for NNPC's 2004 transformation program tagged Project PACE during engineer Funcho Kupolokun's tenure as GMD. From 2005, he became Deputy Director of the Technical Services Department, responsible for cost control. He has had a distinguished management career as manager plant projects in the Process Engineering Department, General Manager, Joint Ventures in the Renewable Energy Division Grid, and in 2015, as Managing Director, Nigerian Petroleum Development Company Limited, MPDC, where he was able to ramp up oil production within a short period of eight months from about 87,000 barrels oil per day to a record 155,000 barrels oil per day at this time. A round of applause for him, please. We can do it better. If you appreciate hard work and excellence, please applaud him. Thank you very much. Sadiq is widely traveled and has attended several management and leadership courses. He is a change agent and is passionate about diversity, inclusion, continuous improvement, clean energy, climate change, and energy efficiency and conservation, and has a strong flair for coaching and mentorship. He is happily married with four children. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Engineer Sadiq A. Mayburno, MNSC. Thank you very much for that. Um, good afternoon. Um, I want to start on the existing protocol, but I have to recognize uh, His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Enugu State hereby ably represented by the Commissioner for Special Duties, um, the President of Nigerian Society of Engineers, represented by His Royalty Engineer Otis Anyeji. Uh, he has left the room, 
But in my days in NMPC, Engineer Otis was always chasing us for one course or the other, organized by Nigerian Society of Engineers. So I, I know him very well. The way back also, I think I met um, Engineer Amain Adetiba, I think it was uh, women engineers. So, right. Um, fellows, members of Nigerian Society of Engineers, past presidents, chairman, NSC Abuja branch, Primus Interpares, right? Engineer Ben Osioko, thank you for this uh, honor of inviting me to, to, to address this gathering. Uh, um, Engineer Francis Ogari, I have to recognize you. He's my friend, he's my brother, my colleague, but also now my regulator. And my regulator is in this room, so I have to behave myself. Thank you for being here. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my honor to be invited to present this uh, paper. Um, it's a little bit, it's a wide area, as engineer Otis Anyeji said, is royalty. Very wide area, but then there's a lot of scope for engineering. So um, I have a presentation, I don't know if they're going to put it on the, on, 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 if they're going to beam it up, yeah, that's it. Um, is there any, how do I move the slide? Do you have to do it or? How do we move the slides? Okay, so they're bringing it. Um, but j just to save time, because I think we've lost a bit of time, the presentation originally is supposed to be in three parts, right? Um, so I intended to, right. Oh, that's fine. This is up and down, yeah? Okay. Is it moving? Down is up. Down is up. <laughs> okay, fine. Right. <laughs> so I intended to present this in three parts, basically trying to introduce the topic of energy transition and climate change, then to talk about the role of stakeholders, and then find time to just present our project, the floating LNG, uh, at a high level. Uh, I'm not sure if I can do that on the FLNG, but maybe just show one or two slides just to save time. But luckily, the project manager for the project, uh, engineer Dr. George Amara, He's also moderating a panel and he's here. If there's opportunity to just go a little bit of detail into what we are doing on the project with respect to how we're mitigating the impact of climate change, I think that would be, that would be fine. So that's really basically how I intend to go. And so I want to start by definition of energy transition. I just went to the internet just to make it easy for us to understand what we mean by energy transition. And energy transition is basically any structural change to energy supply and consumption in an energy system. So presently what we are having is we are moving from fossil fuel to cleaner energy, which is called renewable energy or low emission energy. Previously we had you know, coal, right? There was coal at one time. There was coal in Enugu, and Enugu state is represented here. And then we moved from coal to oil and gas, and then maybe from oil to gas, and now we are hearing that we are supposed to move from gas to renewable. So energy transition has been here with us, it's been going on, but now it is taking a more serious dimension because of the impact of climate change. And climate change is basically caused by emission of greenhouse gases. These greenhouse gases are as a result of human activity. I'll probably say almost 90% of the people in this room drove to this place. I'm not sure if somebody came by helicopter, but you can see that we used cars, and that is also emission, right? So even just by moving around in terms of transportation, we are actually emitting into the atmosphere, right? So that's, that's basically the reason why then the United Nations Framework on Climate Change Convention was set up to actually address this climate change. Now, the problem is global warming. There are some people who don't believe in global warming. I think we have a president of one of the big, big countries who doesn't believe in that science but we know that the temperature of the earth is rising. Why is it rising? Because of the depletion of the ozone layer. Uh, ozone layer is depleted, energy is, uh, temperature is rising, and the whole idea is that science has shown that we need to cap that increase to not more than two degrees centigrade, preferably at 1.5 degrees centigrade. So whereas the energy transition is moving towards renewable energy, I personally believe that it will take time for renewable energy to displace gas. And we know we are a gas nation and an oil nation as well. So we need to maximize those resources before we get there. So there's a target of about 2050 
to be able to achieve net zero, right? Now, whether renewable energy can achieve that by 2050, only time will tell. But in the interim, while the transition journey is ongoing, then we as engineers have to find a role to play uh, in that space. And we believe that gas-fired power generation will be here for the foreseeable future because renewable, as we know, is intermittent. So even if you're using solar at night, there's no solar, right? If you're using wind, some days there's no wind. If you have hydro, sometimes you have low water level in the dam. So again, we see that gas will play a very critical role in that space. Now, I just want to share this table quickly. Uh, the source of this table was a report prepared by BP and Shell with PwC sometime in 2018. So it's an old table, right? But it speaks to something. If you look at the graph on the left, right? In 2016, there is an attribution analysis for consumption of gas according to regions. So you have North America, you can see clearly they're probably the, the biggest uh, consumer of gas in that space, right? Then followed by Europe uh, to, to some extent. Now, fast forward to 2040, where the projection is, is showing there's an increase in consumption of gas uh, by these regions. And even if you look at Africa, which is, I think, the red part of it, you could see that Africa is also increasing in its gas consumption by 2040. So that's consumption by region. Now, if you look at consumption by sector, you can see energy or industry is actually consuming the most in 2016 and is increasing by 2040. So when you have population of the world is growing, there is a statement that by 2050 or so, Nigeria is going to be the third most populous country in the world. Then the question you're going to ask yourself, and I think NSC needs to ask, how do we transport people? How do we feed people? How do we provide energy for them? Because right now there's energy poverty. So how do we do that? So the UNFCCC, as I said, was set up to address climate change. And basically, it is a foundational treaty right, that was signed in Brazil, I think, in 1992. And it was ratified by about 197 countries, basically to address the impact of climate change. Now, there are two key agreements that came out of that uh, convention. One is the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, which was primarily geared at developed nations incentivizing them to reduce their emissions. How do you do that? Emissions trading. So if you, if you sell your carbon dioxide uh, equivalents that you've minimized, you can earn some money. And at one time, the market was doing something like 15 euro per ton of carbon dioxide equivalent, right? Then fast forward to 2015, when we now had the Paris Agreement, which is really a major step towards uh, climate uh, mitigation and adaptation. Um, we now have a legally binding treaty. And that's what makes it interesting, that countries signed legally that they will commit to reduce emissions so that this global warming uh, is not going to happen. And one way of doing that is what they call NDC, which is the Nationally Determining Contributions. And I think we're going to see that uh, subsequent uh, slide. But basically, under the UNFCCC, the COP, which is the Conference of the Parties, is the highest decision-making body. And I know maybe you've heard about COP28 that happened in Dubai, COP27 was in Egypt, in Cairo, and COP26 was in Glasgow, uh, Scotland. So that's the main decision body. Now, what is NDC? Uh, NDC basically is just the commitment by countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. These, com these commitments are driven by policies and measures and strategies and there is a document that was prepared by Nigeria in 2015. Initially, it was called the INDC, which was the Intended Nationally Determined Contribution, so it's an intention. Then two years later, I think in 2017 or so, it was actually ratified in country, so it became the first NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution for Nigeria in 2015. And then this document was updated by the Federal Ministry of Environment sometime, I think, in July 2021, uh, and now, I think by 2025, they're supposed to have a new one. So you have to constantly update based on your uh, economic activities. One of the commitments Nigeria made is the unconditional reduction of emissions by 20% in the year 2030. Then they stretch that ambition by saying we can give a conditional target of 47% reduction, right, by the same 2030, if we have support. 
Now, there's a lot of support, right? Those nations, they have climate change funds, they have environment funds, there's big money that they can be given, but it's very, very difficult to access that kind of money. But more importantly, Nigeria has committed to net zero by the year 2060, and so this is an opportunity for Engineer Ben Osi and Nigeria Society of Engineers to say, where do we play in that space? So this is just showing you the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases in Nigeria. Um, again, this document is from the Federal Ministry of Environment, the source. On the left is from 2010 to 2018. And the key message here is to say that the energy sector contributed to 60% of the greenhouse gas emissions. 60%. And out of that 60%, the oil and gas contributed to about a third of that. Okay, and then now projecting forward from 2018 to 2030, remember 2030 we have a target of reducing emissions by 20%, okay, we can also see that there is an increase, right, in the greenhouse gas emissions by 31%, right, of which, again, the energy sector is now contributing 51%. So before it was 60%, now it's 51%, but again, it's still significant uh, in terms of uh, the increase. So this is just showing you that, look, as we increase in population, our activities go, we develop, we're going to need more energy. And so how do we responsibly uh, use that energy? Um, I wanted to talk about COP28, but I, I probably think I will just talk high level. I won't waste too much time here. But the interesting thing is that under the COP, which is the decision-making body of the UNFCCC, there are some organs, right? They have the COP28, CMA, CMP, but the SBSTA is a technical body. And I think that probably, Ben, this is something that NSC should try to even try to get more information about just by Googling online and maybe engaging for the Ministry of Environment to say, look, what is happening in that space in terms of technical and how do we as a nation apply that? I was able to attend COP 12 or so in Doha, 2013 or thereabouts. And you see the Pacific nations that are at sea level, Nauru, Naiwe, all those, they make the most noise when they come to COP. Because they know that any rise in sea level is going to impact them. But then we know what happened in Bielsa not long ago when there was flooding. So climate change is real, and I think it's something that we should look at. So I just want to talk high level on this one. One more point on this slide, I won't read it, is the issue of a just and orderly energy transition. And I think that's, that's a very, very big deal. Because sometimes when you see women are involved in agriculture, and 70% of the agri labor is from women, 50% of animal husbandry is from women, 60% of food processing is from women, but women only have 20% access to agricultural resources. And these agricultural resources also are impacted by climate change. So how do we then have a just energy transition where the developed countries are the ones dictating what should happen, dictating even how you access funds for projects like the floating LNG and other projects? If you go, they will tell you G7 countries say, well, we are past the consensus, uh, communicate, we are not going to fund any oil and gas projects unless it meets our energy security. So that means of the record, they are selfish. So how do we now then deal with that? Now, um, some resolutions took place in that COP28 in Dubai, and I think it's just important to say that a lot of things will happen in 2025, and I think that NSC should take uh, note of that. But one of the key steps is there is a COP technical team that is set up comprising representatives of the extractive industry, so that's oil and gas, agriculture, etc. Uh, to actually look at these responses. Where is Nigerian Society of Engineers in that space? So maybe that's food for thoughts, right? Yes, technical committee, you have engineers, the Ministry of Environment, F yes. But as a body, what is NSC doing about that? Okay? One key thing also, there's talk about innovation centers to deepen technology efforts. So you know, technology parks and things like that, and I think we'll, we'll see that coming forward. So again, there is opportunity uh, which is why we say, what is the role of engineering uh, in energy transition? Quickly, um, 
Now I'm coming to the role of government and what government has done and is doing and probably will continue to do. Uh, we talked about the NDC that was uh, submitted, but in 2021, November, President Buhari signed the Climate Change Act 2021. And that act set up the NCCC, or the National Council on Climate Change. And that NCCC is really responsible for the National Climate Change Action Plan, and of course, they drive the budget, which is the Climate Change Fund. So that's a major, major step in terms of the aspiration and what Nigeria wants to do to achieve that. Um, there are other things that have been done, and then some documents need to be updated as we go to COP29 later this year, which is in Baku, uh, Azerbaijan, right? Again, I reiterate, the government has to do certain policies to make sure that we decarbonize and meet our net zero target by the year 2060. Again, government has initiated some things. So you had the gas flare uh, commercialization program. I'm sure Ogari knows about that very well. Uh, I don't know exactly where that is, but again, it's to capture all the flaring that is happening and use that flare for something more uh, positive. We are all aware of the CNG program of government, not only to address subsidy that has been removed on PMS, but also CNG is a cleaner fuel than petrol. Uh, and I think that there is a presidential uh, CNG initiative uh, in, in the presidency that is looking at that. But one thing about the CNG is you need to have the gas, right? So I think the AKK project and other gas sources need to be there. Otherwise, if you drive your car from Abuja to Kaduna, and then there's no gas, you are done for, unless if it's going to be a dual fuel. So again, this is where autogas and other things come in. Um, automotive biofuels program, I was involved in that in my past life. I think during the introduction, I, I, I was, it was mentioned I was in renewable energy division. Um, biofuels is basically saying we use energy crops, sugarcane, cassava to produce biofuel, or we use palm oil to produce biodiesel. Uh, that project hasn't happened, but probably it's not being overtaken by events if we're really doing CNG. But then these are things that you can do to mitigate impact of uh, emissions. Now, how can government encourage or incentivize customers and citizens to not only monitor their emissions, their carbon footprint, but also to actually reduce emissions? If you have a solar panel in your house and you, ha you are kind of off-grid or semi-off-grid, so you have clean energy, when you are not using that energy, what happens to it? If you have ability to inject that power, that clean power, back to the grid, you should be able to earn some money, even if it's not physical money. So your meter should run the other way, and it should run faster the other way because you're injecting clean energy into the grid. And so there's something called feeding tariff, a bit complicated, but that's something that a role that government can play to encourage more people to go off grid. Um, of course, we need to strengthen the regulatory framework to encourage climate-friendly investment. So NMDPRA is here. We hear talk about electric buses in Lagos. Okay, people will be like, you need to generate the electricity from something before the buses run. But again, it's something. If I have an electric bus, I can be given a very commercial route to ply. So Joe Legba, Ikoroduro, that, that would be a route I would take. And if you have an electric car, you can also enter the bus lane. So these are the incentives that I think that maybe we should be looking at. But I think good to say that government has actually initiated public sector reforms or power sector reforms, which is really helping that even states like Enugu can go into power, uh, generate power, sell power, etc. So I think that's, that's what it is. But primarily, I think we need to accelerate investments in low carbon electricity, primarily by adopting renewables. Um, now, role of engineering and technology. This is where we are. So we talked about oil and gas sector contributing to 50% of the emissions by the year 2020. Again, what opportunity is there for us uh, to do, to look and to see? That oil and gas, one third of that energy sector emission is coming from, from oil and gas. So, and we see that oil and gas will remain dominant probably till the year 2050, right? Even though they're saying phase down, phase down but it will be there. So, so long as we're an oil and gas country, we have to sit down and think, how do we maximize the assets that we have to be able to develop our country to meet the population increase that we're looking at, and more importantly, before they come and say, you cannot use oil and gas again. Now, a regulator is here, Nigerian Content Development Board is also with us, and we see the partnership that can happen because they also look at project by project how capacity can be developed in country. 
can we domesticate or domiciliate, domiciliate uh, technology in country? So Nigeria Society of Engineers, again, need to partner with the regulators to see what opportunities there are to be able to do that. So for instance, they have what they call CDI, which is the Continuous Development Initiative. They have the High Capacity Development, HCD, which is training of engineers. Even on our project, we have trained engineers. So the question is, do we have a database of engineers that have been trained so you can have a talent pipeline? Are we in a position to export our talent? If you see Philippines, they export sailors. Six months, nine months, they're on the sea. What can we export as a country when it comes to talent in engineering, right? And we have people that are there working on big, big projects. Uh, Ogari knows that. But do we harness them? You know, so that's probably something, again, I think Nigerian Society of Engineers should look at. Um, energy efficiency, energy management, I think is very clear. I don't need to talk about that. But there are other things in technology, carbon capture and sequestration. That is an area I know that uh, Ogari is also interested in. Now, one area is hydrogen. Sorry, I keep on picking on you because I know that's your area. Hydrogen. Hydrogen, in 2003, I went to Japan. They were talking about hydrogen car. Fast forward 2019, I was in Toyota plant in Nagoya, and they had a hydrogen car, a Toyota Prius, preparing for Tokyo Olympics. So you can see where there's a will, there's a way, right? And hydrogen is the player in transportation, which is the example I just gave now, but again, even upstream. I know that Baker Hughes was looking at using hydrogen as a dual fuel to fire their turbines, which is cleaner energy, right? And of course, hydrogen has different colors. So you have green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen, whatever, right? And hydrogen produced from renewable sources, maybe it's green hydrogen or something. So again, I'm just saying food for thought for people. I talked about transportation area, CNG, et cetera, so I won't waste too much time on that. Um, so I'll go to the next uh, slide just to save time. Renewables, again, we talked about wind, solar, and hydro. These are intermittent power, right? But they are there. What opportunities lie for us as a country and as a body, Nigeria Society of Engineers? Now, I think that a, there is a data or information from the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, uh, which says that consumption of renewable energy is expected to grow faster than any other fuel so source. And they think that by the year 2040, two thirds of the global power generated will come from renewables, and by the year 2060, 90%. But that's a projection. Till then, we'll see. So the question then, again, I come back is, how can we as engineers and Nigerian Society of Engineers champion renewable energy technologies, adoption of renewable energy, through partnerships, right, to be able to address the energy poverty that we have in Nigeria? Grid will not go to some villages, but you can have off-grid power, and that will change them. The women in the villages that are farming, they may need that power to grind, to dry, to do all sorts of things, especially those who fry gari or something. How do we do that? And that will help us to meet our NDC targets. Interestingly, I talked about technology parks earlier. This is something, again, NRC should be looking at, because you're going to have capacity building opportunities, right, to move to a low-carbon economy. But there is something called technical needs assessment. Now, I don't know, is there a technical needs assessment that's been done for Nigeria? And if there is, was Nigeria Society of Engineers part of it? Food for thought, right? But if we look at that, these technology parks are opportunities for young people to really have their talents unleashed. We went to India and we saw a technology park that was set up. And just because a decision was taken, some people bought a gas pipeline to provide power and feedstock to those technology parks. I know there was a time they were talking about, uh, is it Ogidibe or something, right? A long time ago, yeah, somehow it didn't happen. But that was a very lofty idea that could happen. This will help our youth and our people. And I talked about the gender inclusion and uh, inclusion uh, energy transition. I talked about the women who are in agriculture. Uh, so I will just do that. Now, I want to quickly save time by going to our case study. This is the uh, UTM FLNG project. Uh, it was said it's the first floating LNG in Nigeria, bespoke, which means designed from the scratch, uh, is what I would say. Um, and we thank the regulator, NMDPRA, here for really providing strong support and leadership uh, in that respect. Uh, the project is being sponsored by UTM Offshore Limited, 
And the managing director is there, Mr. Julius Sonny, who has been invited to be a guest here, but unfortunately he is not in town, so he sends his apologies. Um, we are partnering with NMPC, so NMPC owns 20% equity. And that's why you see Dr. Sali Jamari there, the chief investment officer of NMPC Gas and Power Investment Services, right? He's part of the people driving this project, and my good self. And then we have Dr. Ken Anyahu, uh, our executive director uh, business, and then Dr. George is here, the project manager. So I talked about major parties to the project, and I've been talking about N NMDPR since they're in the room. Uh, they are key regulatory agencies that we work with. Of course, Nigerian Content Board is very important to approve the Nigerian Content Plan for this project. Yeah, this project is new, hasn't been done in Nigeria before, but then again, we'll see what the opportunities are in terms of technology transfer, etc. right? But this project, we also have the NUPRC, which is the upstream part, helping us a little bit with the gas supply, because you need the gas to be able to do the project. Stakeholders, NMPC 20%, UTM offshore 72%, Delta State Government uh, 8%, and then we have Vitol, who is a trader that is going to uptake uh, the volumes. Engineering is going to be done by two EPC contractors, JGC of Japan and Technip of France. These two built the six trains of Nigeria LNG, and they're still working. And then also they built, I think, about almost three or four of the floating LNGs in the world. They are very reputable. And when the project is completed, the operations and maintenance will be done by JGC, and we have a plan over a 10-year period to actually transfer knowledge and technology to Nigerians so that they can take over the running of the floating LNG. We have been helped with by Afrexim Bank as a financial advisor, and then we have a legal team that is working for us. So this is just the overview of the project. I'm going to rush just to save time. Um, we are taking the gas from OML 104, which is the ExxonMobil NMPC joint venture, right? And they call it, there's a Yoho platform there. The beauty about this project is that you go to where the gas is, right? Today, Nigeria LNG is waiting for the gas to come to it. So if gas doesn't come or the pipeline is attacked, you don't get the gas. But you just take your vessel, sit on top of the water, connect it, and you just have your gas. And the beauty is that if you run out of gas, you can unplug the vessel, take it to another place, and connect it. So long as the gas specification is the right one, right? So that field has 2.2. TCF, trillion cubic feet of gas, of which 1.1 is associated gas and 1.1 is non-associated gas. Now, associated gas is gas that is related to oil operations that would otherwise have been fled if it is not captured. So by just putting this project and taking that gas, we are removing flaring almost zero. Unless you're gonna have operational flare and all that, and the regulator is very, very strict even on that. So, um, and then we are going to produce about 2.83 million tons of LNG per annum, of which we have about almost 450,000 tons of LPG. And LPG is cooking gas. Imagine now, today, I think LPG is about 17,000 per cylinder or so. Yeah, and, and people are crying. So at least the more we produce LPG into the market, hopefully the price will go down. People don't need to look for dollar to be importing LPG. And then, of course, this is just the first of maybe two or three other projects. So there is value that will come uh, from this project. Um, so this is just a pictorial view for engineers. They may be interested in that. That's the vessel on your left. The blue part is the scope of the contractor Technip of France. They are very good in the hull, the body of the vessel, right? And then the red part is the top size, which is the Japanese content. That's JGC, right? Then you see there's a green part there, which is the turret mooring, where you actually hook and anchor the vessel to the sea seabed, right? That's also a subcontractor called Sofec, but it's working together with the Technip. That's the blue uh, contractor. And then, of course, you have your subsea pipeline that is going with the risers, everything, going to the Yoho platform to be tied in there to receive the gas that comes in. So that's basically how the project is. Um, well, what are the benefits? So what are the performance things that we're looking at? So I'm talking from the perspective of emission reduction now, not just the project generally. And so again, in the design, we are maximizing energy efficiency in terms of just the choice of fire heaters, process optimization, 
heats and material balance, whatever, these are just technical terms, right? Choice of heat exchangers, etc. This is something that we are doing. While we are maximizing energy efficiency, we are also minimizing the energy use. So today, if you have a Japanese car, they say it's fuel efficient, is it not? Again, you buy some TV, they say it's low energy and this and that. So this is something we are looking at in the design and, and you know what? working with the, with the regulator on that. Of course, we intend to reduce emissions on the project uh, through certain, certain uh, devices. So this is, there is the detailed engineering design is gonna happen. Maybe Dr. George may speak to that more maybe if there's chance uh, to, to, to do that. Um, there are lots of things that we are putting in place to make sure that there is no pollution uh, in the system. Uh, uh, but more importantly, you see waste heat recovery is an, an energy saving system where the exhaust heat that you have, you take it back, again, to actually generate more energy. So again, this is something that, that we're looking at, and I think we're going to have about three of those uh, waste heat, uh, waste, waste heat uh, recovery units in there. Um, design of flares, again, this is something we're looking at, make them smokeless, make them efficient, etc. So I won't really bore you with that. Um, again, we have seal system that actually prevents uh, leakages. Uh, and a leak detection and repair program. And then the choice of compressors and turbines is big when it comes to uh, low emission. So we really need to lower emission of noxious gases. Now, this is my last slide. What role for Nigeria Society of Engineers? What role for Council of Registered Engineers and other engineering bodies, right? Um, we know that the society today is marching towards a carbon future. It may not necessarily be in Nigeria, but the world, when I say society, I'm talking about global. If you go to UK, for example, right, there's some people called stop oil or something. They glue themselves to the floor, they go and paint buildings, and they do all that. Those things will keep on happening, right? So society is marching towards that low carbon future. Whether we like it or not, we will get there. It will be 2050, it will be 2030, we're going to get there. Consumers are also having choice. Right? I want something that is clean. I want something that is cheap. Right? Why would I use firewood if I can use gas? But it has to be affordable, has to be accessible, has to be available. Right? So the question is, do we have carbon conscious engineers? Ben, do you know your carbon footprint? Right? No, it's true. So because that's where it starts. We don't wait for somebody to help us. If there's flooding in Bielsa, there's desertification in Borno, Lake Chad is shrinking. What are we going to do? There's erosion in the southeast. This is also human activity. So, though I talk about carbon, but you know, carbon impacts on the environment and the climate, and it has other impact as well. I talked about database of engineers earlier. Do we have that within the NSC or Coren? Especially for people that are trained in the oil and gas sector, right? And any monitoring and evaluation systems. Again, I'm asking questions. How do we build momentum to accelerate that pace on our energy transition journey towards our target for a sustainable low carbon energy economy? This again is a question as engineers we need to ask ourselves. There is energy transition, it is real, it's gonna get there. And I used to see one picture in one elderly man's house. He said there are three sets of people in the world. There are those who make things happen, there are those who watch things happen, and then there are those who wondered what happened. They were just sitting down, whoa, 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 what happened? People have left you behind. What are you going to do? You need to be in that space. So how do we as engineers help to create, oh, I call it green jobs, right? I like it, it's a sexy idea. Green jobs. Jobs that you can say today, if I'm fixing a regulator for a cylinder, or I'm doing something about CNG conversion kits for cars, that is a green job. Am I going to be recognized? Do I get any incentives? Like people who are handicapped overseas, right? They have special parking space, right? How do we say we will create green jobs to ensure that green future that we want? And I talked about innovation centers earlier. Ben, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to play in that space? What position, what role can Nigerian Society of Engineers as a body play when it comes to that. Now, synergies. We have Federal Minister of Environment. They're setting up a COP technical team. I don't know if Nigerian society 
of engineers is involved directly in that. There's the Carbon Council, right, or Council on Climate Change, and Triple C is there. They are coming up with policies. Uh, do we have input in that? There's an energy transition office that supports the energy transition implementation working group that was chaired by the then vice president, uh, Osibajo. I don't know what's happening to it now, right? Where the energy transition plan of Nigeria was approved. Was Nigeria and Society of Engineers involved in that, right? Of course, there's synergy with the regulators, NMDPRA, NUPRC, NCDMB, but I also know that there's a body called NACENI. They're there, right? What are we doing with them? There's PTDF, I, there's MBTE, it was mentioned, I know MBTE, my sister-in-law works in MBTE, so, you know, I'm just talking about what we can do uh, as, as a body. Now, I think I talked about the energy transition plan, so the question then is what kind of advocacy will the Nigerian Society of Engineers play in the space of energy transition? I want to end by making a statement that I need immunity and, you know, I used to say that when Goodluck Jonathan became acting president, his first cabinet, and I stand to be corrected, did not have a single engineer in that cabinet. So how do we then lobby, make our voices heard? When we talk about inclusion, right, is a seat on the table, but more importantly, a voice on the table, right? So how do we make our voices heard? How do we make that impact? And I think His Royal Majesty, His Royalty said something about the diverse nature, the role that the various arms of engineering can play uh, in this space. I wanted to even talk about biotechnology, but I just said, look, it's not necessarily relevant, even because it's technology. But even biotechnology has engineering application in terms of what you do, either in the agricultural space or something, which can also mitigate the impact of climate change. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention, but again, it's food for thought for all of us, and I will leave you with the last slide. Thank you. I think he deserves a better round of applause, and of course, he has a standing ovation. Thank you, sir, for that knowledgeable and insightful presentation. And he has presented a challenge to engineers in the house. I hope we'll not be part of those who wondered how things happened. Let's be a part of the change that will happen. Let's be a part of the transition. Please give him another round of applause. Uh, moving on very quickly, we'll be going to um, the panel discussions. But before we do that, I would like for us to just get up and stretch a bit because we'll be sitting for another 30 minutes. You can just move in one minute, just move around and uh, pay someone a compliment before we'll come back and sit for the panel discussions. Just stretch. Stretch so that we don't have to sit for so long. If you are still sitting, you are wrong. Just get up for a minute or two and stretch. Thank you very much. So you may kindly be seated in 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one second. Please kindly be seated.
Please be seated. If you are still standing, you are wrong. Please be seated. Can we move on to the panel discussions? Those in favor say aye. Thank you. <laughs> the eyes have it, actually. Thank you so much. And so um, for the next 25 to 30 minutes, Your Excellency is very distinguished, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be moving on to the panel session where we have very seasoned professionals lead us in compelling discourse on the sub-themes for this event. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'll call on the, moderat the moderator of this session, who in turn is going to call on all the panelists and have them introduce. With a resounding applause, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the moderator of the panel discussions, Engineer George O. Amara, PhD, MNSC. Please give him a round of applause, please. It doesn't seem like we're ready for this discussion. Please give him a better round of applause. Thank you very much. I think it's afternoon now. Good afternoon. Um, last week, we had a, a similar thought-provoking session. Uh, it was with uh, the women and the youths at uh, the National State University in Kefi, where we talked about uh, energy transition, especially on the gas space. Uh, we talked so much on how the youth, and especially the women, can take active role in uh, gas penetration and utilization. This afternoon, um, the, the session is well opened uh, by my senior and my boss, Engineer Sadiq. Where are the engineers in all these energy activities? Your morning is your morning. If today is our morning, then we have to start running so that we can catch up with the world. In order not to talk too much on, uh, before we go into the panel session, I want to introduce my colleagues in the industry. Uh, one of them, Engineer JJ Musa, uh, has, I think it should be like my third project is uh, overseen. So I can say we are partner in development, especially in the gas space. Uh, I want us to welcome uh, our seasoned uh, engineer who works as a director of gas in NMDPRA to the podium, Engineer JJ Musa. <laughs> Keep clapping, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Yeah, you can sit there. I have uh, a second season practitioner. Uh, additional has led this uh, society which is known as NLPGA, that is uh, for the LPG, for years. I remember I attended one of your, uh, your conference at, uh, in Lagos. Federal Palace Hotel, Bermuda Convention Center some years ago. And he has been passionate about this gas expansion, energy transition. And that champion has taken him to the presidency where he served 
as the leader for the gas expansion program at the presidency during the time of uh, our former vice president, uh, Yemi Yoshibanjo, uh, His Excellency. Warmly welcome my fellow engineer, Adeshino, to the podium. afternoon, we are going to talk about uh, the role of engineering, engineering, not just engineers. Sometimes when we talk about engineering, people think about the engineers. We have the technologists, we have the artisans, we have the other people, we have even the legal people, we have the court people that all contribute to the success of everything engineering. So this morning, or afternoon, we're going to talk about what are we going to do as a body that supervises engineering, the leaders in engineering, the managers in engineering, for us to be actively involved in the energy transition? Luckily uh, for Nigeria, we have a lot of able hands that have walked through this path, especially in the oil and gas space, in uh, civil engineering, highway, infrastructural development. But what is needed at this point, as uh, the keynote speaker has mentioned earlier, is the synergy, the drive, and for us to be part of the policy-making processes. Today, we have someone from the regulatory that can also speak to the policies of the government. I'm going to give them two, two minutes to speak freely on what they understand as energy transition, especially in Nigeria. Let me start from my far right, Engineer JJ Musa, please. occasion because there is no better time to discuss energy transition than now and we heard it very loud and clear from the speaker he spoke a lot on what is happening globally you know because of the climate that is changing and is traceable to emission and other activities of human beings so it is actually a good occasion to discuss that and also in Nigeria there is no better person to discuss on this energy transition than the regulator. I have over 30, 30 years experience in the industry as a regulator. When we started, I knew where we started, how much of this emission we are making in the, in the country, how much we are actually pushing out as flares. To surprise you, there was a time we were actually looking at it and we discovered a company that is actually sending almost 15 million scoff into the, into the atmosphere as a porch gas. And when I mean porch gas, I'm not saying when there is flare, uh, t uh, actually need for the flare to go out, but just to sustain the light that is there. So we started pushing for that and today we can say there is a drastic reduction in the volume of gas that is being flared. And actually, the speaker also spoke about uh, 
gas commercialization. We were part of the team that actually drafted the regulation and the guidelines for the gas commercialization. And right now, I would say we have auctioned most of the flaring sites in Nigeria and development is going on. So all this are actually means to curb the emission. But also, when we talk about transition, we are maybe moving from one form of energy utilization to another. And like the speaker said, maybe to a better way of uh, enhancing the energy and utilizing the energy. When I started as a regulator, we could count the number of LPG plants that were in the country. Actually, at that time, we, had, we didn't have up to 10. And so I was keeping database. But gradually, that number grew from 10 to almost 200 and something before I left that department. So when we say this number have increased, and right now we are also still having LPG shortages, that means the number of people that migrated from using firewood as source of energy to gas has really uh, multiplied uh, geometrically, if I will use that word. So energy transition is actually a means to uh, improve the e efficiency of the energy that we are using, uh, to also improve the energy that we are using environmentally so that uh, we'll be able to keep our environment the way it is rather than destroying it. And that is the reason why we move from firewood to coal, from coal to gas, and from gas now we are moving to bioenergy. So this is the much I think I understand by transition. All right, um, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, energy transition started with um, the previous president, Buhari, in 2015, when he went to the COP21 climate change meetings and committed the country to 20% emissions reductions. Before that, uh, this was further 20% from the 45% mandatory emissions reduction which the country was liable for. And two major programs were submitted in the NDC that year. Um, the National Gas Flare Commercialization Program, which would reduce um, gas flaring, and the LPG Expansion Program. Um, subsequently in 2017, I became involved heavily in that program as the senior special advisor on gas and then the program manager for the national LPG expansion implementation plan. Now, energy transition means a great deal to someone like me because the impact that it carries out, um, moving from dirty fuels, firewood, kerosene, charcoal, to gas um, also creates a multiplier effect in terms of health, cardiovascular diseases, um, and employment generation when those things actually transit. So where does engineering fit into all this? Our everyday life has to do with engineering and engineers. The interesting thing is I'm not an engineer, but all my life, Everything that has ever earned me a single cobble has to do with engineering. And I've worked closely with engineers all through. <laughs> so, just like uh, engineer Meibonu has said, and he, this is someone I've worked closely with, he's a very good friend of mine for over 45 years. Um, where is engineering? in the energy transition plan. Without engineering, there's no energy transition plan. You want to move from, um, from fossil fuels to gas. The technology required, engineering plays a huge role in that. You're moving from uh, fossil fuels to wind energy. Engineering plays a big role. 
you're moving to hydrogen, you're moving to solar. Engineering plays a significant role. So without engineering, all these things can take place. Now, I'll take a cue from what he also said, which is, where's the Nigerian Society of Engineers? I was part of the Energy Transition Working Group. I was also part of the team that looked at the auto gas implementation, which involves CNG. So auto gas, if you Google it, is actually propane, LPG, not CNG. But the country has taken CNG to be auto gas, which is fine. I mean, you can use all gases, LNG, CNG, and LPG. The most important thing is to be able to utilize it for our own good. Yes, we have 2060 as the target, but do we abandon 210 TCF of gas simply because some countries want us to use their own renewable sources when we need the money, we need employment generation. Moreover, we contribute less than 1% to global emissions. So why do we abandon what God has given us for what other people want us to use? Yes, it's important to transit. And that's why the previous government insisted that gas had to be a transition fuel. Because before that, anytime you spoke about gas, they said, oh, it's a fossil fuel. But when Ukraine happened, it was convenient for them to say, use gas. It was convenient for Germany to all of a sudden quickly build two LNG terminals, receiving terminals. So, energy transition for us, important, but more importantly, we need to play a, a significant role, and I'm talking about the engineers now, um, to have a seat at the table at any point in time. If you take the transportation sector where the government has focused on with CNG, I don't think anyone, and I haven't seen it, I may, I may be wrong, from the Society of Engineers ever challenged the government to say, if you are removing subsidy on petrol, and I'm not trying to be political here, how come you're using CNG, which competes favorably with diesel, if you remove the subsidy? How come that's what you're using to fight the PMS subsidy and not propane or LPG? So there's several ways that the energy transition can have an impact on the public and the Society of Engineers can play a very significant role in guiding the government into some of the actions that are <coughs> excuse me, being taken. So I'll stop here. Yeah, yeah I thank you for a very thought out uh, introduction. Uh, when we're discussing uh, issues, especially around the uh, energy transition, uh, we also try to bring into the mix the energy security, which you touch a little, and also talk about the framework and the policies, all right, which uh, our guest from NMDPR has touched a little. Um, before we go to the next questions, we are talking about uh, especially energy in power deployment, smart grid. Uh, the keynote speaker talks about re-injection of your excess power into the grid or even to the captive system, which is already done in a lot of cities in the world. Abuja is a new city. Abuja is under developing or is, is undergoing development. So these are things that engineers can also be thinking about. If I'm building a new estate, do I have a gas pipeline to the people, the women or the men cooking in the kitchen? If somebody, if I'm deploying a, a renewable energy if I have access from their KVAs, can I put it back into the next person's house that doesn't have a smart uh, power? And also we're talking about the engineering challenges and opportunities in the transition to green energy in Nigeria. We're, we're talking about uh, transportation, which the government has taken up strongly. And for you to have transportation network, you need the storage, 
You have the mother station, the daughter station, here and there. So for us as engineers, see what we have mentioned a little bit, so I'm going to go to the next question. How will engineers take their rightful uh, place or position in Nigeria energy sector? Let me start from you, uh, additional, please. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just like I said earlier on, um, if you look at the, and I guess the easiest one to always use is the one that everyone shouts about now, CNG. The NADDC, because really, before you can implement, you're actually supposed to have a policy, an autogas policy. That autogas policy defines the um, rules and regulations of you playing in that sector. The NADDC is charged with that responsibility. Now, I only exited from my previous position last year, and at the time, I was actually coordinating with the NADDC and Autogas policy. I don't recall the Society of Engineers being part of that discussion. Um, and that's, those are areas where I mean, those are very quick wins because that's what the government has taken as a as a as a as a front burner um, to get involved in some of the um, implementation strategies, the policies, because it also involves you training people to use conversion kits to be able to use dual fuel, both the petrol and CNG or LPG or LNG. So that's a key area. Um, if you do your research very well, you find out that some countries refuse to use or started with one and then transited to another. Most places you start with LPG and then you transit to CNG if the infrastructure is available. Now some of the challenges we have as a country is that pipeline gas where pipeline gas is available, then the CNG is cheaper. Today, where's the pipeline gas? Mostly in the south. So what happens to the rest of the country? Because you're not removing subsidy from just the south, you're from the entire country. So in order to be able to service the north, Kirby, Meduguri, Sokoto, and all those places, you need to have refueling stations. Moreover, CNG is more expensive 200 kilometers out. So what do you use in that case? two things. One, more ex I mean, extremely expensive, LCNG, which means you take LNG, you compress into, into, into CNG, but there's transportation costs, there's the gasification cost, there's compression cost. So at the pump price, it definitely won't be cheaper. Now, LPG is more established. There's nowhere in this country that you don't have either an LPG plant or find an LPG truck. You can layer on that infrastructure because it's propane you're going to use. More importantly, the LPG kits are cheaper than the CNG kits. And in any case, the infrastructure is easier and faster because all you need is a tank and a dispenser. So engineering, again, and engineers play a huge role uh, making sure that these things happen. Um, the emissions reductions that come with the LPG is even more than the CNG from the studies that have been done. So I, I see no reason why we can't take advantage of all these things. Thank you. Uh, uh, um, from the policy and legal framework and uh, design and implementation, can you please respond to what can engineers that have been the operators and the practitioners do differently to possibly liberate this sector of the economy and also own it? Thank you very much. Uh, my co-panelists talk about how engineers should take their rightful position. But one thing that we always forget as engineers, we always only, the way I see it, only during engineering week that they hear about us. We are lost totally in this country. First and foremost, 
I want to know here if anybody can tell me where you have had a legal department in any organization that is headed by any other person other than a legal person. I have not seen it, even in our own uh, uh, institution. You have never heard where uh, a medical facility is headed by somebody different than a medical doctor. Even when you go to the government, that is in the highest level, the federal government, come to the states, come to the local, leave those ones, come to different organizations. In the oil and gas sector, I think it is none. There is one, I don't need to mention name, where that organization is carrying out a turnaround maintenance of its facility, but the head of that department is not an engineer. So when I heard that, I asked a question, some of my colleagues, I was really very bitter about it. I asked my, that question, I said, where have you heard a country that is in war, fighting war with another country, and then the head of the defense or the minister of defense is not a general, is not a general. That country will, will lose that war straight away. Or where you see a, a, a finance department that is headed by a non a, a, a non-accountant, they will squander the money because they don't have any knowledge. But that is what is happening today in Nigeria. We only hear of engineers when there's engineering week. But you go to the institutions, we don't know anything that is engineer. So I think the first place where we have to start playing is we have to start being a force in this country. And where can you start being a force? I don't mean we should take a placard and be going around and be saying we are engineers. How many bills have we sponsored in the National Assembly? At least this issue that my colleague talked about CNG and the policy on CNG or policy on LPG, it shouldn't come from the presidency. Or well, if it's coming from the presidency, it should have been originated by engineers because we understand the situation. We should be able to bring it out. So it's not that somebody is bringing, we should participate. We should be the driver. And there are other aspects of uh, development in this country that require the presence of engineers. It's really very uh, pathetic when it is only when you hear that the building has collapsed, then you hear their setting committee and they want to bring engineers to help to find out how many, when we had one, the first building collapse, how many policies have engineers in this country brought about to make sure that next time when any building is going to collapse, it must really be sure that the engineer is not there. That is why it collapsed, none. So that is a problem until we begin to show our physical presence, not only by shouting, but also by fully participating and driving the engineering sector in this country will go nowhere. So now to the question that he's asking, if I should now say, you know, in the energy sector, there are so many aspects that engineers will play, so many things that we can do. But first and foremost, there are process and procedures where it has to start. Uh, last year, or last two years, I have been the chairman of the regulatory drafting committee of our organization, and we drafted close to about 20 regulations or thereabout. And the PIA requested that for every regulation that we draft, we have to call for stakeholder engagement. We publish most of this, and you know most of these regulations are technical regulations, and have a lot of engineering play in it. But to our greatest surprise, the feedback that we are getting and all the inputs that we are getting, we didn't get anyone from Nigerian Society of Engineers. We didn't. But this is where we can show that yes, we know what we are doing. From the, from the interpretations of the terminologies to the utilization of words, even in that document, we need to show our expertise because we know what it means. So there are so many places where we can play to actually take our rightful position. Let me stop here. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, it's getting interesting, much more interesting. Um, we know that in this sector, we own it. Uh, but what happens when you leave your house for strangers? Uh, some days you come back and you'll be locked out. I think that is what is uh, really happening in the energy sector. I'm limiting it to energy today because we are talking about energy transition. Every engineering sector. And uh, it's obvious that uh, we have not speak out enough and we need to do better. Uh, lastly, uh, before we round up, uh, because the time is quite limited, uh, there's going to be a, a, a room for a few questions and answers. So if you have something, jot down, you can ask. Uh, we will respond the one we can. Uh, we also bring our keynote speaker, if necessary, to respond. And uh, the ones we may not be able to respond all today, uh, uh, it's something that can be done, uh, maybe virtually. Last list to our panelists. We have just talked about where we have lapses, the gaps that we need to be closed, the activities that uh, we need to do, the engineering uh, society need to up its game. What are those things? Can we just enumerate them? What are those things that we need to do urgently? We can say number one is this. What do you think are those key things that engineers need to do? Whether you like it or not, if the policies of the government are not favorable, everybody's going to the same market. And sometimes the engineers want to sit behind and maybe let's allow the politicians to deal with this and that. But at the end of the day, we all take the brunt. So what do you think, uh, Engineer J.J. Musa, engineers should do urgently, like from now, so that we can help the society where we all of us are all uh, the cohabitants? Thank you very much. Uh, some years back, you know, uh, by the course of my uh, work, we send people to go to review designs of facilities. We send people to follow up with construction and also to test those uh, facilities or equipment, whether they are designed and working according to the design. So what we observed then is that it became a jamboree where the person that is at the top, he sends whoever he wants to send. And there was an instant where they, had, they sent a lawyer to go for an engineering design review. And the lawyer went there the first day. The lawyer was there. It was headache. And then suddenly the lawyer did disappear and stayed in the hotel and refused to go. I know most of these reviews are done overseas. So they picked their Esther coat and then disappear. And nothing is done. So what we did was to bring out a policy in our organization that anybody that will go for such kind of engagement is not just only an engineer, but it's a registered engineer. And I'm sure those people that were in the NSC that time and current, you will have seen a lot of flood of staff from that organization that came to register. And we know registration is not just come and pay the money and go, you have to pass through some activity. Exactly. So by the time they pass through activity, you know whether they qualify to be engineers or not. So the first thing that we need to do is, uh, I would say, as a society, we need to make a bill to the National Assembly to mandate all institutions that have engineering activities going on, that nobody other than an engineer should participate in such activities because they are specialized activity. And engineering work is not an ordinary work that anybody can do. It's a specialized work, just like medical, just like uh, legal, it's a specialized work. And so when we get that kind of bill through the National Assembly and the bill comes in, then we have a strength to go to other to go to the institutions and mandate them to actually respect that bill. So I think that is the first thing that we need to do. Secondly, the thing that we need to do also, I think there is room for 
engineers to start partnering because we are always alone, except if a company that uh, recruit us to come and work, that is when I will meet uh, Engineer George. But no, some of us here are actually uh, on their own. They are private. There's nothing wrong in me meeting Engineer George and said, Engineer George, can we partner together and set up an, a company that will do engineering or that will do construction? I'm saying this because there was a time I was in the US and I met, I don't know who, how many of us know Keystone. Keystone Engineering. Keystone Engineering was formed by three friends. They are all engineers that left a company and decided to come together and formed a company that today is called Keystone. So we need to start knowing how to synergize with one another. Even if the companies are not one company, but let's see how our company will partner with each other. And then when you do that, also there is a platform, both in NUPRC and NMD period where you go and register your company. And then with that registration, you will now be able to move into the industry to play in the industry. Then lastly, also in the platform, in NUPRC platform and NMDPRA platform, we have a provision for technology adaptation. We are doing energy transition and the speaker actually emphasized on uh, improving on our engineering design. And in COP28, one of the drive that moved away from uh, fossil fuel ex uh, extinction to actually migration is technology. So there are a lot of technologies that are outside there that are not yet in the country. And also there are a lot of technologies that are in our heads that are not yet being deployed in the industry. So feel free, articulate your technology, present it to NMDPRA. We have a department called Technology Adaptation Department. If you are able to present that technology and we see that it is valuable, it's something that we can use in energy transition, you will be approved and given a license to go and deploy that technology in the industry. And oftentimes what we also do is that we seek a pilot site for you and say go there, test run your te technology there and let's see how it will work and then what it does then it can now be. And also the speaker talk about exporting technology. It is only when we begin to do this that we can now start exporting technology out of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned some brilliant things that we need to do urgently. And one of them I always speak to, especially for some of us in the industry, is synergy. Uh, if you don't have, even if it's different organization, as you mentioned, let's form a consortium. Uh, there was something we did some years ago where we have to tell the practitioners, especially the Nigerian uh, companies in engineering, to come form a consortium for a particular project. And it was a very good test case. Uh, even the organization, the big uh, four or five engineering firms in the world, they do come together. You can see what was showed on the project that I'm driving. Technip know that they cannot do everything. They bring JGC in. As of today, we are going to do the fabrication of the vessel. The shipyard has now even entered as a toddler. Costco is coming in as a consortium. So there's nothing wrong in coming together. That's the point I want to make. So we really need to see how we can come together, become a strong voice and a strong force. Uh, Mr. Deshino, please, uh, can you speak to that? Uh, as a player and uh, in the engineering sector, what can engineers also do urgently so that we'll be held, we'll have less of these issues of building collapse, pipeline the eruptions and other things and where we, we can also play more. Okay, thank you. I think um, synergy, like you said, so collaborating with some of the other associations, so when an energy transition mode, collaborating with the Renewable Energy Association, RIAN, is one, Nigerian Gas Association, all the other associations, I, and I take this from the, my experience as a former president of the Nigerian LPG Association, 
we used to be, we didn't have the muscle <coughs> because we were smaller players. Um, but Nigerian Gas Association had bigger players, Shell, Ajib, and MPC. And what we did was to collaborate with Nigerian Gas Association and started having them attend our own uh, conferences and we attend their own conferences, making presentations in their own uh, 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 conferences and them in ours because there's a synergy. We need the gas from upstream, midstream processed to also get the LPG. So there's nothing wrong with uh, the Society of Engineers partnering with these major associations that are already embedded in the energy transition program with the activities that they do. Um, also, um, if you look at the presentation from, uh, from, from Sadiq on the vessel and what uh, Engineer Musa was just talking about, about those various companies, there's nothing wrong with you having Nigerian companies if they have the competency, collaborating and replacing some of those uh, uh, companies that you see there. Because ultimately, if you look around, some of those companies, you find Nigerians embedded in, that, in, the, in those companies already. So, I mean, those are some of the quick wins. Then lastly, I think some of the policies of government, um, if you review them, and you have to be a thorn in the flesh of government, consistently advocating for your, for your, for your members and knocking on various doors. When I was president of the LPG Association, I was resident in Lagos. But I remember one year when we calculated my ticket stops for coming to Abuja to talk to government, there were 33 in one year. And that was coming to talk to government because government never really supported the LPG sector. It was kerosene subsidy. But even then, not until much later did we realize that kerosene wasn't actually the, the, the uh, the, the enemy that you, we thought it was, it was actually firewood because in the cooking mix, 30% is kerosene, 5%, uh, uh, sorry, 60% firewood, 30% kerosene, 5% charcoal, uh, and 5% uh, 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 LPG. And not until 2015 when the government was going to submit their NDC, and the policy that we, as an association, put forward to government, which they embedded in the national gas policy, once that was passed, that was the first time the government actually started to recognize LPG, and the LPG expansion camp plan came about because of that. So you really need to look at some of the policies of government and be in government's face all the time to say this is where we need to play in. This can be done if we don't participate in it because the consequences are very dire. So you need to be, I mean, well, an activist sort of, but they need to hear your voice. All right, a clap for him, please. So, sorry, engineer, if I will say one more thing. Okay. I don't know, maybe we are doing or we are not, is the issue of continuous learning. I think engineering profession, we have left that behind. Because I can remember the last I passed out of my school, I have not gone for or called for a continuous learning as an engineer in the profession. So maybe we need to also make it in such a way that if I am a society of engineers registered, then for me to keep that registration, it's not only that I pay annual due, but maybe after two years, I must come to renovate my license and then my certificate as an engineer. That is done in the medical sector. It's done in the accounting sector. And it's all done in the legal sector. So if you don't do that, I may be a first class student at graduation. But because of the exigency of time, I found myself doing other jobs other than my engineering. But I still want to claim engineer. And so when opportunity comes, I say I'm an engineer, but meanwhile I've left my engineering a long time ago. So I think that is another thing that we need to start looking at, continuous learning. 
Thank you so much, uh, Engineer. Uh, as we round up, um, we have taught, uh, touched on a number of things. Uh, one of them I want us to, at least we can treat as an urgency. First of all is when even the young engineers see that the head of an engineering uh, institution is an engineer. He encouraged them. I interface with a lot of uh, young engineers, uh, mid-level engineers, during mentorship and coaching and other things. It's, and I've also worked in a place where, for example, your, your leader has never even been in an engineering circle like him. And you need to explain and explain and explain. And there are some even brilliant ideas that will be turned down because maybe they are only looking at it from the economic point of view. Not even safety. Not even the processing. So we need to start talking within ourselves and also to the stakeholders in government. There's no reason for somebody that is not an engineer to really drive policies of the government for engineering sector. We need to say that. We need to say that. And also, uh, the young people, as I mentioned in my opening uh, speech, the young engineers, the bank, banking sector and other people, they know they are bright minds. They come early to snatch them because they are not jobs. They snatch them, put them in the banking section, they start counting money. Uh, so the best case you can be in is maybe IT, a little bit of IT, FinTech. We need to also encourage them to take the engineering profession seriously and that leverage on what engineer J.J. Musa is, say, just said, if you don't practice engineering, you cannot call yourself engineer. You can't call yourself engineer. So we still need to do that recertification. There's nothing wrong telling people that after two, three years, you need to prove that you are doing engineering. That people will take it seriously. Um, finally, uh, on this panel, uh, we also want to thank the leadership of uh, Nigerian Society of Engineers from the president of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, the chairman of this branch, and the, the team of uh, leadership. Uh, it's been a very good uh, outing. I remember I was here, I think, about two months ago for the first, uh, the pioneer chairman's uh, uh, memorial lecture and it was also well attended. Thank you, everyone, and let's take these things to mind, and wherever we need to. If you have a question, quickly before I round up, okay. I can see one hand, two hands. There's no lady. We have to be gender inclusiveness. Okay, all right. No, the man behind you first. Let's have your name, well, if you I'm recognize. I'm engineer, Felix Sobiora Okay. Fellow Nigeria Society of Engineers. I want to first of all thank you for the presentation. Thank the chairman for having given us this opportunity. But I want to make some observations. It may not really be questioned, but some observations. <laughs> My good friends talked about um, training, of retraining of engineers. I think you should understand that we have a Korean assembly. The focus of Korean assembly is actually retraining. But the problem is that people come in there and just play politics and greet people and go. There are programs, there are activities, there are papers that you need to go into and you have to learn. That is a refreshing course. If we actually take it the way it's supposed to be. That's an aspect I want us to look at. But there are some questions I have. It does on, uh, you know, as a novice, I'm a novice, but I want to know what is the advantage of CMG to PMS that we are now trying to face out. We are following the West to look at what we have. We are looking at gas, CMG. If our refineries are working, are we really sure that the cost of PMS is supposed to be what it is today? It's only in Nigeria that you have four refineries at the same time for so many years under this country. None of them is working. Every second we're being told, Port Harcourt will start refining this day, water will start refining. In fact, an MD of NMPC told us before Buhari goes, the refinery will work. And nobody is being held accountable. And he's an engineer. Mike you, he's an engineer like me and you. 
So when we are saying that we are not playing, engineers are not there. Engineers are there. We need to own up what we are saying. That's what I'm asking. What is the advantage of CMG to PMS? Why is our refinery not working? And why are we supporting the West against what we have? West is talking about electric cars. Everybody is shouting electric cars. Why should we stop using our gas PMS cars for crying sake? Is it the most that we should join the West and to do what we have as an advantage? Renewable energy is being talked. When Ukraine, this Ukraine war showed everybody that Ukraine depends on all their energy mix on nuclear power. And Ghana, as you said, Germany had to rush. But here we are killing our coal pipelines, our coal gas production entities. Everybody is shouting nuclear. What is happening to our coal? I think we need to change some narrative and not follow the West to kill what we have. That is what I'm looking at. And I said, I need to say it now that we should not follow the West and kill what we have. We have abundant oil and gas resources. We should not follow the West to kill what we have. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I will give you one minute, two minutes. One minute, one minute to Sorry. respond. Yes. Then Sorry. maybe I'll summarize. Yes. So just to respond to him, the first one. All the questions. No, let's no. We we'll take all the questions. No, let's be answering because we don't know the time because of the time. Yes. Okay. All right. Go so, ahead. so just to answer the first one, I I actually don't mean training. I mean recertifying your certificate. Like the medical line, I know if you don't come back for that recertification, your license will be seized. So that is it. So it's not the training. Then the second one, actually, it's not the issue of uh, price control that we are moving from CNG to, uh, from moving from PMS to CNG. But like the speaker spoke, also is for us to be able to mitigate emission. We reduce emission. And when we reduce emission in Nigeria, we are not actually, when we are bringing the CNG, we are not saying we are facing the PMS. Yes, we have challenge of PMS not available because the refineries are not up and running. But if Dangote refinery comes up and start producing the piece PMS, we have sufficiency and we are not having any policy that say Dangote should not sell the PMS here. So the CNG is not actually a kind of cost control against the PMS, but it's also to be able to cope the emission. And if we are able to cope the emission, we'll be able to trade our carbon because we are emitting low, we'll be able to trade and make money out of it. Thank you very much. Well, um, so yes, there's, uh, there's no reason why our refineries shouldn't work. Um, on this, and, and there's no reason why I said it in my earlier presentation, why should we abandon the gas that we have, 210 TCF, uh, just for renewables? The gas plays a significant role. And just to buttress that, Portugal runs 100% of their thermal stations on gas from where? Nigeria. So, um, it will still become, I mean, it's still very important for us to use the gas um, and not trade it away simply because um, renewables will come in. It has to be an energy mix and you have to use your comparative advantage where one is cheaper, use it. Uh, where one is more expensive, discard of it. So that would be my submission. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, the question is well addressed. We are not facing our PMS. It's just that it's uh, subsidized. So they want to take out the subsidy. And, uh, and they believe the palliative can come from CNG. I think that is where uh, that drive is coming from. But uh, we all know uh, that it might not be the right answer. And that is where we are also talking about when we, the operators, speak of people that really know this game. If you don't speak, people that are speaking may not know, and they will, will all suffer for it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Microphone, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Engineer Nebo Lisa Modi. 
fellow Nigeria Academy of Engineers. Um, sorry, uh, I came in late after the paper had been presented. But I want to ask, because he was saying something about uh, flawless registration of uh, companies with, on the platform of NUPRC. Know that uh, it is almost impossible to register a company on the NMPC platform. Many people have tried to do that. It is not an easy thing. So if the NUPRC platform is working well, it's something that needs to be emulated. I also uh, want to lend my voice to the issue of uh, synergy that uh, you people talked about. And uh, I've been retired from public service for almost 10 years now. And I see one or two of my colleagues, uh, former colleagues in works in the, in the hall here, as also interact with them. And one thing that is extremely missing because somehow we have allowed the expatriates to take over the engineering space. Because somehow we have failed, due to so many factors, greed or whatever, to partner and collaborate with each other. Most of the firms that we used to know in Nigeria, once the initial promoters pass on, that company is as good as dead. But if we can work on our own and form synergy, collaboration, have proper governance structure, and a board, people can now be employed as professionals to run these entities, gradually our people will begin to take over the construction space. And it is something that we must start doing today. We don't need to start uh, to wait any longer. We just have to start doing it. Because so many, if I use Ministry of Works, there are people that are so intelligent and all that. They're retired as directors, Deputy director, what is, how much is their pension? The people are almost, uh, but the narrative can change if Nigerians take over the engineering space. Uh, actually, it's very consistent with uh, a paper that I presented then to the body of permanent secretary in 2013, and it needs to be worked on very seriously. Thank you very much. Uh, we understand that uh, it's more like uh, support of the drives of the discussion we have today. And uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, we know there are a lot of sound minds. And uh, sometimes they say when you retire, it's not that you are tired. So you have to, especially as an engineer, we expect that you you bring your expertise into the mix. Uh, I think something like that is going on with UTM FLNG. Our keynote speaker today said he has uh, done uh, about 35 years with NMPC and other subsidiaries. Um, we feel he has so much to give to the floating FLNG and is here supporting us on the project soundly. So it's something that we can really, really take advantage of. Uh, also, especially people on the infrastructural space, Nigerians are good in civil and other infrastructural business. Why are we having so many Lebanese? I'm not single out any ethnicity or race. Why are the people doing all the business of building high rises in Abuja? Where is this policy coming from? So we need to really sit up. There's so much that we really need to talk about within ourselves. Uh, Madama, briefly please, our time is uh, fast spent. Thank you very much for the privilege of... I think I'll just start with the last statement you made. 
Uh, I'm a civil engineer. I retired as a director from FCDA, having gotten so much experience. My first desire is to be a contractor because I believe that we, as, as professionals in the contracting space, will do better than other contractors who are not engineers. But as I tell you, I'm almost two years retired now. I've not been able to get a good job <laughs> because of what we're saying. And I hope as we keep pushing, we'll someday get there. Uh, you know, one thing always stood out when we have an uh, occasion like this to discuss engineering, and that is the fact that engineers, we don't really um, push our issues. We don't make noise about our cases. We don't, you know, in a way, try to drive, put force into the things that should benefit us. But uh, while Engineer Musa was talking, he said something which, you know, I, I, I really appreciated. He said, sometimes, you know, issues come up and you don't see an engineer in, in an organization pushing forward. Or Nigerian society, you know, fighting to ensure that engineers are given their rightful positions. And that is true. But I, I, sometimes the problem we have is we bury our heads on the site in calculation. We don't even know what is happening around us. You will be surprised that some of those news, we don't even hear about them. We don't know about it. So I want to plead that any engineer that is in any position of, uh, in a privileged position, that know that there's an issue that engineers should, NSC, current, should come up and fight. Please let the leaders, let the officials know. Because if we don't know that there's a problem in a particular place. You may not really know how to fight it. And so if we are informed, if engineers are, attention of engineers are drawn to such, you know, issues in any organization, maybe they will be able to fight. And the other quest, the question I have is uh, about this RPG, CNG issue. You know, recently I read, uh, uh, somebody was really fighting and speaking on the television and said, this CNG is a fraud. As far as it's concerned, to get the conversion kit, I'm not, I'm not an electrical engineer, but I take interest in some of these things. He said to get the conversion kit, you have to import. And we're still using our dollars that is so expensive to import those kits. Then why do we have to go for CNG instead of LPG like that? My brother keeps, you know, crying. So I don't know, like you keep saying, what we can do as a society as professionals, as, an en as engineers, to bring government to understand this issue so that things will get better for us as a nation and as a people. Thank you. All right, I think uh, we need to round up now. Can, um, can, can I just respond? Just uh, one minute each from the panelists, then uh, we'll close. I know you are standing up already. Yeah. yeah. So so I want to start from my sister's uh, last question. I think uh, as a body, what we need to do, like she rightly observed, is to write a position paper to the government. So when government bring a policy, and especially it's a policy that has engineering inputs, engineering society should sit down, get the bra best brains, sit down, dissect that policy, and if that policy is not good for the government, they should have our response immediately. So, but if we don't do that, they won't know we exist. So, and then the other thing that also I want to say with regards to uh, engineering in the place of work, I want to find out here, uh, my executive director, uh, sorry, not, uh, yeah, executive director that just left here, Engineer Gary, and the authority chief executive of both NMDPRA and NUPRC, they are engineers. So when they took office, how many NSC executives visited? Did we visit them as, as a body to recognize with them, to celebrate with them, to invite them? They are in Abuja. To invite them official, or, you know, arrange a special occasion to honor one of our own that have taken a position like that. So those are some key simple things that when we do, we begin, they begin to recognize that we exist. But they took office, I'm sure if it were a, a attorney general or something that they announced, you will see they will call for an occasion, call cameras, 
celebrate with them. Why? It's not because they have money, but they want to show their presence, and we have our own there. But they are there, and we never care to even visit them to see how they landed their assembly. Then finally, also, uh, my brother there, the fellow, talked about uh, participating in the oil and gas industry. Yes, I was part of the team that were driving this local content. So local content, local content. And we forced that construction should be done in Nigeria. And we started. Some of the issues that we have is financial guarantee. I think NSC should start thinking on how to start coming up to become financial guarantees to some of those industries. How you're going to do it, how you're going to set the policies that somebody will qualify. Because I believe if we go as a body, strong, and meet any financial institutions in Nigeria, we'll be able to guarantee one of our own that is want to do a project, and we'll be able to execute. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll take a cue from what Engineer Musa has said. Um, NUPRC, uh, NMDPRA, they're both engineers. In fact, if I stand outside there and throw a stone, you hit an MDPRA yeah. just here. Um, so, again, collaboration and synergy are very important. To what Madam said, LPG, CNG kits, both have to be imported. Now, yes, one is cheaper than the other. What we need to do is domesticate. If you encourage the manufacturers with your policies, they will set up here and we tested it. A lot of them are interested in doing that, but there has to be commitment and seriousness because you don't want your equipment to arrive, then they're stuck at the port for another six months because one customs officer thinks that the policy of removing VAT and uh, duty is wrong. So it's encouraging domestication and manufacturing that would solve that solution of getting both kits manufactured here. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, okay, um, the keynote speaker wants to say something? Okay, come up, please, yeah. Just, please. This is a thought uh, searching session, so give us additional five minutes, please. Many thanks to the uh, panelists for a very uh, robust conversation. Uh, please, we are engineers, we are in this room. The theme is the role of engineering in energy transition. We are playing our role in this room, even before we leave. And we have to speak truth to ourselves, right? And when we keep on saying, where is NSE, where is NSE? Actually, NAE was also on my mind when I talked about synergy in my presentation. And engineer, you are not here, but I think they also have a role to play, right? So for me, I was in Executive Council of Nigerian Gas Association, 2018 to 2020. What they did was they set up study groups. They had study groups, right? And that's something that I think that NSC should copy. Um, and Jina Musa talked about, okay, how many engineers came to meet the ACE and the CCE uh, and to engage them? I think that we need to set up some study groups. What is happening to turnaround maintenance, right? What kind of policies do we have in government? How do we work in that space? How do we get contracts? to people who have retired, who can add value from the engineering perspective. I am aware in Saudi Aramco, and I stand to be corrected, that they even encourage some of their refiners, three years, five years to retirement, retire early, set up a company, area one, FCC unit, whatever, you are the expert, we give it to you on a business basis, right? If the plant is running, you will be paid. And if it exceeds targets, you will be compensated through a bonus. You incentivize, right? So I think that we are not here to put Ben or Nigerian Society of Engineers in, on trial, but beyond attending conferences, AGMs, and I paid for Corin and Nigerian Society of Engineers, I'm not even sure if I'll attend, but okay, 50,000, 70,000, you, you pay, right? I think that I need to leave this room be, being honest with you. I registered as a member of Nigerian Society of Engineers maybe not up to 10 years ago. And I graduated in 1983. Why? It's because of this same thing, AGM. It's only AGM and conference that we do. And I complained. 
And then later, because I was like an experienced engineer, they called me for a special interview. And they asked me a question. And I said, I, I, don't, I don't see the benefit of registering as a member of Nigerian Society of Genius. And then I told you this story. And my wife said to me, well, you keep on complaining that they're not doing anything. You can only bring about change if you are inside. And that was why I registered, right? And that's why I'm here trying to speak to you the way I'm speaking. So we are not here. We have to be realistic. NAE, NASENI, Nigerian Society of Engineers, Koren, you know, Energy Commission of Nigeria, we have to be on that table and we have to have the voice to be heard. And that's why if you see the last slide I had, right, I talked about NSC advocacy drive. I keep on putting question mark because I'm just trying to create thinking in our mind. But my last slide on the way forward was still two question marks. We have to co-create the way forward. Because one late president said to us that you, you can't shave my head in my absence. We have to be there. If we are not there, then they will leave us behind. So again, as I said, there are people who make things happen, there's people who watch things happen, and there are people who just wonder what happened. They see don't looks. Which one are we? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. contributors from the audience today, uh, we decided to stir the nest a little. It's just the beginning. We're going to do much more. We need to interact better. We need to come together better. Uh, the world is a big space for everybody to play. I notice uh, sometimes, uh, maybe especially in the public sector, people go home, a big go and leave with their assignment. And I was like, why? Why would somebody go and leave with your assignment? Because they believe that the person you hand over to may take over your, your role. And we are not moving forward. The country is not moving forward. So there are a lot of things that we need to do, especially as a body. We have to make a statement to the government that for every engineering institution will be either the head or a strong member of the body. So we need to start putting our house in order. When we do that, the system will recognize us the better and we'll be able to change the country for our good. Thank you, everyone. And it's a pleasure being on this panel with this uh, great gentleman and experienced uh, mind. Thank you and God bless you. Can we better appreciate them? They've done a fantastic job. Thank you very much. We'd like to invite, um, okay, okay. So, Sam, where's the cameraman? We're going to take a photo session. Where better, on the podium or down? Okay. Up here. Okay, so please a round of applause for the guest speaker as he comes up for the photo session. Thank you. Okay, while well, that is being done, uh, an ash-colored Honda with plate number BOG372BM is blocking someone. Somebody wants to drive out. Ash-colored Honda BDG372BM. Please go out and repack your car. Thank you. And that, while that is going on, too, I'd like to announce that uh, we have Dina tickets up for sale at 10,000 Naira for a card. The dinner cards are up for sale. A card admits only one person. For the awardees, if you want your spouse to accompany you for the dinner, you have to buy a card for your spouse, a ticket for your spouse, and that costs 10,000 Naira. Okay, uh, moving on very quickly, uh, we'd like to take uh, remarks from some of our very special guests here present. And we're going to be do the, doing that in one minute each. We're giving each speaker one minute to give us a remark, and then we'll be done. First off, I'd like to call on the representative of the Honorable Minister of Innovation, Science, and Technology, Engineer Isaac Namdi Anum, Director of Bio Resources and Technology. Please come up for your remark. Your time starts now, sir.
Good afternoon. Yeah, standing on uh, uh, existing, already established uh, protocols. I'm representing the Honorable Minister of uh, Information, Innovation, Science, and Technology, who would have loved to be here, but due to other national assignment, he have asked me to come and uh, make a remark. Speech by the Honorable Minister of Innovation, Science, and Technology, Chief Uche Naji, at the 2024 Engineering Week, an annual general meeting held on Tuesday, 27th August, 2024. I am highly delighted to be the special guest at the 2024 Engineering Week and the annual general meeting of your society. The timing of this event is up in view of the need for the country to have energy mix for a stable power and for the country to be highly industrialized. Led, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, engineering in general and engineers have a greater role to play in the energy transition to guarantee stable and affordable power supply in the country so as to generate the required job opportunities and for wealth creation. Few decades ago, the country relied on energy solely from hydro, and this had caused the country serious embarrassment, leading to low generation, insufficient transmission, and ineffective distribution across the country. This is unacceptable and cannot make us achieve our mission to be among the top 20 developed countries in the world. This administration with the Renewed Hope Agenda has set power as a priority to achieve reliability as such has integrated renewable energy design and implementation of solar, wind, and hydroelectric power to reduce dependence on fossil fuels. Let me at this time inform you that the energy transition is not limited to the integration of renewable energy. Rather, the efficiency through the development of energy efficient technologies and systems to minimize energy wastes, the modernization of the grid and decentralization by upgrading and expansion of the national grid to take care of renewable energy sources and ensure reliable energy supply. Overall, I am happy that the first phase of the digitalization of power supply has commenced with the expansion of the distribution by the various state governments. Distinguished gent gentlemen, it is important for the country to have a good policy direction. Driving the engineering sector, this will not only shape the sector, but also support the transition to a sustainable energy mix. This has been done by the Federal Minister of Innovation, Science, and Technology through the Energy Commission of Nigeria and other stakeholders. It is equally important to have a continuous and robust research and development for improved efficiency and affordability in the renewed energy technologies. The ministry is also encouraging innovation and entrepreneurship, capacity development, among others. Just a few days ago, I turned the note for the establishment of the Barefoot Renewable Energy Academy at the Kogi State University of Science and Technology, where middle, middle and high cadet manpower will be trained. The present administration of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu is on the trail of having stable and affordable power in the country, and as such, has charged on hands to be on desk for greater commitment to this cause. I hereby challenge us to join us in achieving this purpose. As engineers, I equally solicit for your cooperation to, miss, to make this mission reality. I'm open to ideas that will make this work for our country and to be among the committee of nations to guarantee stable power supply through 
renewable energy. Ladies, the single ladies and gentlemen, may I inform you that the ministry alongside other partners are equally set to have achieved a good energy transition, thereby reducing greenhouse gas emission in the country. Let me at this juncture thank the organizers of this event, the chairman and planning committee for putting this event together while wishing you a wonderful week. Thank you for your attention, Chief Uche Naji, Honorable Minister of Innovation, Science and Technology. Thank, Thank you. Can we appreciate him for keeping to time? Thank you. Please, if you have a prepared speech, we would like to humbly appeal due to brevity of time. Please abridge it. Thank you very much. Up next, we have Mr. Emmanuel Magjaja, representing the CCE NUPRC, and he's the head development and production NUPRC. A round of applause, please. His time is already to kick in, so applaud him better so he will come up faster. Thank you. Thank you, Director of Program. Um, she has already won. We give a brief speech to keep to the one minute. So kindly permit me to stand on existing protocols. I am representing the chief executive of the Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, Engineer Benga Kumulafe, who is unavoidably absent, but sends his goodwill message on the occasion of the Nigerian Society of Engineers Week, an annual general meeting 2024, termed the role of engineering in energy transition. You'll all agree with me that the world is moving, moving to from um, fossil fuel-based energy to renewable energy, and of course, you agree with me that for countries like Nigeria, in several fora leading up to the last um, COP28, we've made the case for the world to let countries like us develop our God-given resources, which is the fossil fuel. And in that instance, we've pushed cases to develop the cleaner, fossil fuel, which is gas. So yes, we're in the energy transition phase. That circumstances, the engineers have a very, very important role to play. Um, the keynote speaker, the panelists, and all of the speakers have talked about what has to be done, what the country is doing, and what each and every one of us have to do in this period of transition to make, to create sustainable value from our God-given resources. Um, they talked about the Nigerian Gas Flare Commercialization progr uh, Program, which is being championed by the Commission we talked about um, the oil and gas companies developing their fossil fuels. And for us, in doing that, which is in line with the narrative the government is pushing for us to continually develop these resources to create value, we have created the energy transition and carbon monetization section and the commission that is responsible for coordinating all of the decarbonization policies of the oil industry to ensure that in developing our God-given resources, we are in line with ESG energy um, 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 environment sustenance and governance goals. In this role, 
implementing of implementation of um, um, NGFCP, ensuring all development projects are compliant with decarbonization policies. Engineers have very key roles to play, from conceptualization of equipment and machineries to design, construction, maintenance, oper operation, operationalization, and maintenance of all of this equipment. And as such, that's where the NSC comes in to lead the way in building the capacity of the Nigerian engineers. Madam Elia from um, FCD has talked about has talked about experts occupying positions Nigerians uh, Nigerian engineers are supposed to um, um, play in. Engineer Joseph Musa has talked about non-engineers occupying positions engineers are supposed to play in. We want to urge the NSE as a foremost organization of engineers in Nigeria to take this up. Look at all of these aspects. Work closely with your engineers, with your members, and ensure we create value for the country. The NEPRC is open to collaboration with yourselves, every other organization, to make this happen. Once more, on behalf of the Commission Chief Executive, I want to thank the Abuja branch of the NSC for creating this avenue for all of us to come, sit down, chat the way forward, highlight the roles of our engineers in this very important period. I want to thank you all and wish us all a fruitful deliberation. On behalf of the Commission Chief Executive, thank you once more. Special thanks goes to the branch president and his members and all of you for seeing this event as important enough to come give your laudable contributions. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for one minute in 10 minutes. Give him a round of applause, please. Next up for his remark, uh, it is my singular honor and privilege to call on the representative of the Managing Director of Rural Electrification Agency, Engineer Umar A. Umar. He is the Executive Director, Technical Services. A round of applause for him, please. One minute stands, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, I'd like to stick to the existing protocol. Uh, and also the timing of one minute. Uh, like rightly introduced, I'm Engineer A. Umar. I'm the Executive Director of Technical Services with the Rural Electrification Agency. And uh, part of the discussion we're having today is centered on energy transition. And I think you can't talk about transition, of course, without talking about renewable energy. And of course, we all know REA has a very strong role to play in the deployment of renewable energy in Nigeria. Presently in Nigeria, we have about a population of about estimated 80 million people without access to electricity. This is bigger than countries such as maybe Germany, for instance. So I think uh, we have a very big problem ahead of us. And uh, in terms of addressing this issue, the Rural Education Agency has been doing a lot, a lot in terms of our projects and programs. Uh, so I think such forum and opportunity uh, we cannot pass by. I know I have only one minute, but maybe I can talk about uh, a few of our activities 
and uh, what we are doing in terms of the deployment of renewable energy. Uh, as you all know, uh, the funding of REA comes from mostly three sources. Uh, one of the sources, of course, is the capital project, which is what is appropriated by the federal government. Uh, you would see we have projects such as the solar mini grids, solar home system, solar street lights, etc., etc. But uh, to just break it down, since uh, this is an engineering forum, uh, what we usually do is if we have a community whereby we want to electrify this community, maybe this has been placed in the budget, uh, what we will do uh, starting is to check what is the distance of this community from the national grid, whereby the distance is more than, it's less than 10 kilometers, naturally what we'll deploy is just a grid extension to that community. In cases whereby the distance is more than 10 kilometers, we would now look at what is the characteristics of this community. For communities that are uh, in clusters, uh, we could deploy solutions such as the solar mini grid. But in communities which are sparsely populated, we would naturally deploy uh, projects such as the solar home system. Uh, so for that's what we have under the capital. We also have the Nigerian electrification project, which was a grant from the World Bank and African Development Bank, a uh, total of about $500 million. And the success of that uh, has led to about an extra $750 million, which will be expanded under the distributed access for renewable energy scale-up, uh, whereby we are going to have a lot of solar mini grids deployed across the country. Under the NEP, we have about over 150 uh, solar mini grids, and these solar mini grids are present, are present, and they are functional. And uh, I know I have a lot to say. Maybe I'll round up in 30 seconds. Uh, and uh, part of for us as REA, uh, part of what we see uh, as, as as a way, as part of solving our issues regarding electricity, most most especially, is instead of just concentration on the national grid, we'll have different small solar mini grids popping up around the country. And these solar mini grids will be able to power up small communities and activities, socioeconomic activities in these communities. So when I'm talking about these uh, mini grids, I'm talking about those with maybe capacity of 100 kilowatts, 200, 300, 400 kilowatts. So uh, we have a lot of that. Uh, for the second phase we are doing, we are even making sure they are now interconnected mini grids, meaning they are going to be also be connected to the discos. And a lot of these discos are on board for the DS project. So I think uh, without taking much of your time, at REA we are doing a lot, uh, and I think we are very open to collaboration. We've done collaboration with other ministries, other agencies, and of course, m personally myself, I'm a member of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, and also I'm also an engineer uh, in an executive position. So on behalf of myself, on behalf of REA, of course we are open to any discourse. Like the special speaker said, uh, if, if the outcome is to make these working groups, we are presenting ourselves, we are willing to be part of this discourse. Uh, I think thank you very much, and I wish everybody a successful life. Because they are open to collaborations, we are going to forgive him for exceeding one minute. Please give him another round of applause. I'd like to very specially recognize in our midst the Registrar of the Council for the Regulation of Engineering in Nigeria, Engineer Professor Adisa Ademola Bello, a fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers and the fellow of the Academy of Engineering. My boss right there, please give him a befitting round of applause. Thank you very much. I'd like to also recognize in our midst the Chairman of the Nigerian Institution of Builders, FCT Builder Usman Okay, If you're here, please wave and let's appreciate you. You're welcome. We're delighted to have you here. I'd like to also very warmly recognize the chairman of the Nigerian Institution of Town Planners, Rekiat Fache. If you're here, please. Women Town Planners, please applaud her. Thank you for being here. We are glad to have you here. So to speak on behalf of all the professional bodies or give us a remark, on behalf of all the professional bodies here this afternoon, it is my honor and privilege to call on the chairman of the Nigerian Institution of Architects to speak on behalf of all the professional bodies. Please join me in welcoming architect Yemi Shola Adebi. A round of applause, please. Thank you. The better you chair her, the quicker she comes up, and the sooner we finish this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director of Program. You are doing very well. I'll try to do this in seconds.
Good afternoon, very distinguished guests and engineers um, here present, and of course, our allied professional bodies. I would like to align with the already established protocol so that we can save time. Thanks for having us, Engineer Ben Hosey, um, Chair Abuja Branch, Society of Engineers, on this very well organized annual general meeting and your engineering week. This is what we do. We love it when we collaborate. And I can see today that the guest speaker, the keynote speaker, and the panelists talk about synergy and collaboration. And this is what we promote within the seven professional bodies. And I'm really very glad we are here today because I was just whispering to the vice chair that came here with me that we thought engineers have actually gone far, even more than the architects. So the issues are not so um, different. They're not peculiar to the engineering sector. I will encourage that you continue in that um, synergy and in that collaboration. And the team for this week, Engineering Week, is actually apt and is well chosen. The role of engineering in energy transition. Just to note that we must transit creatively. We must transit innovatively, and we must transit sustainably. And we know that you're going to take that, um, um, take that up from this um, engineering week. Innovation has its roots in sustainability and um, creative approach to it and sustainably handling it is the way to go. So climate change is not hyped, it's real. And uh, the earlier we work on energy transition, the better. And we'll be looking up to you as engineers and we'll really be very ready to collaborate and synergize with you in moving this country forward. Because when we get it right in energy, we get to try it in our businesses. And uh, we were wondering why expatriates take up our job. They'll continue to do that if we don't engage government. We must be on the table as professionals, and we must work together. Together, we are better. Together, we are one. We must work together as professionals in handling this. If we need to be politicians, and I think engineers have done well in that. We have produced governors. We have also tried as architects. We produce um, vice um, president of this country. But we need to do better, especially for the future generation. Because um, leaders create the future. The future is already here. So the tomorrow we're looking for, we have to start working on it today. And together, we can achieve this. Together, we succeed. So I wish you um, a successful deliberation, because I understand it's a long is a week-long program, even as we continue in this um, celebration. And also to thank you for recognizing some of the elders in engineering and giving them award tomorrow. Please continue in this third. Wish you the very best. We'll continue to support you, work together in making sure we have the Nigeria that we desire as professionals. Professionals also, we must work with politicians, the brokers, as the nexus to solving the Nigerian problem. The Global world will not solve it for us. We have to do it. And the change we desire starts from us. Thank you for having us. God bless you. Thank you. If you agree with me that she kept to time, give her a round of applause. True talk, what a man can do. Please applaud her once again. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for tarrying this long. With a standing ovation, and a resounding applause, Your Excellencies, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor and privilege to welcome up to the stage our special guest of honor and His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Enugu State, Barista Peter Undubisi Mba, ably represented here this morning by Mr. Ajogu Sunday, Emeka Commissioner, Special Duties, Enugu State. A round of applause, please. Let's not be tired, we can applaud him better. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please, uh, I will also crave your indulgence to stand on already established uh, protocols. My name is Honorable Ajo Guson de Mecca, and uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of the minorities in the hall here today. 
on behalf of the 1% of the attendees who are not engineers. So pardon me if I, <laughs> if I speak as non-engineer. I bring you greetings from His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Enugu State, Barrister Peter Ndubi Simba, who would have loved to be here in person, but for the exigencies of office. I want to start by thanking the organizers of this program for finding His Excellency worthy to be the special guest of honor on today's event. The gesture is highly appreciated by His Excellency and he sent his regards. The, I listened with uh, keen interest while the program was going on, and I wish to say that I do not regret being part of this program from the beginning till this point. As a layman, like I said, I've learned one or two things. From the guest speaker, to the panelists. The guest speaker actually did judge justice to the theme of, of today's uh, uh, program, the role of engineering in energy transition. The Nigerian Society of Engineers in her 66 years of existence has played a very uh, vital role in building this country. And uh, it is my belief that in this era that we are talking about energy transition, that the Nigerian Society of Engineers and the engineers should not also be left behind. The Abuja chapter of the NSC also um, I can say that they've played a very dominant role also in uh, the infrastructural development of this, uh, our nation's capital, Abuja, today. I think their 40 years of existence have been very, very impactful. I want to uh, align myself with the last speaker who cautioned that why transiting, that we have to transit with caution. Um, well, I'm a layman, I don't know, but let it not be that I wake up one day and uh, maybe the earth has become so cold and we're being asked to go back to fossil fuel again. So I think we have to know the point at which we, which we should stop the transition. Because as you rightly said, the guest speaker, you said the transition is an ongoing process. I believe that the time will come when we have to uh, put a stop to the transition. The, I wouldn't want to conclude this my small uh, uh, remarks without um, trying to relate to you what we do in Enugu, the relationship with uh, the Nigerian Society of Engineers and the Eng engineers in Enugu State, and some of the challenges that we face on a daily basis. You know, um, His Excellency the Governor of Enugu State, in his campaign manifesto, promised to construct a total of 10,000 kilometers of roads in eight years in Enugu State. And being a very serious-minded governor, it is not just a mere campaign promise. Because if you, are, if you have visited Enugu recently, you will agree with me that His Excellency is already walking the talk. In the last one year, he had constructed a total of 71 urban roads 
10 of the rural roads under construction are at final stage of, stages of uh, com completion. Recently, in the executive, State Executive Council meeting, we just approved the award of an additional 141 urban roads with additional 20 rural roads. The Green Smart School project is one that is going to witness a school by electoral ward. It is a massive project. All the projects I'm, I'm talking about is they are, the smart school projects are load-bearing uh, projects. I hope I'm right. Load-bearing uh, projects. <laughs> Am I right? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, about, uh, we have 260 words. And work is going on in 127 of them as, as we speak. Just last week, just last week, an additional 133 was awarded, and the contractors are moving into site as we speak right now. I just want to mention these two, and now go into the challenges that we face. Some of the panelists, one of them actually made mention of, uh, you know, the uh, prevailing circumstance where, where that's, that's glaring us in the face uh, with respect to the issue of uh, building collapse and all that. I want to tell you that um, there's a trend that if not checked, by the Nigerian Society of Engineers will make a mess of this noble profession. I'm sorry to say this, but every mess in today is being referred to as an engineer. They supervise building, they do the setting out to completion. I'm talking about three-story building, messes, people that didn't pass through the four walls of the new university. and nothing happened. I wonder why it shouldn't be criminal for people to impersonate engineers, when it is criminal for you to impersonate a lawyer, when it is criminal for you to impersonate a medical doctor. These things have to do with human lives as well. Because as the buildings are collapsing, oftentimes people lose their lives. In Enugu, for instance, our small school project, there is a high-level committee set up by the governor, headed by the secretary to the state government, that moves around from one project to the other. Why? Because some of your colleagues have made themselves uh, willing tools in the hands of contractors who are just there to make money, irrespective of the consequences of what they do in the sites. The engineers will be on, there on site. A contractor will bring in local gravel where the specification is granite, and he wouldn't say anything. A, a, an engineer will be on site where a contractor will bring in 16 mm in, in reinforcement in place of bringing 12 mm in place of 16 mm. They use it as starter bars. And the engineer will not say anything, maybe because of small change. I think beyond the issue of quackery, I think we have also have to deal with the attitudinal attitude of some of your colleagues. They are denting the image of engineers, and it doesn't speak well. The duty is for the Nigerian Society of Engineers to rise up to the occasion. Somebody uh, suggested um, taking a bill to the National Assembly. Why not? It is possible. It is something that can be done. And the moment to do it is now. Because a lot is going wrong. A lot is going wrong. Having said this, I am made to understand that Today's uh, event marks the last 
uh, annual meeting of uh, the current chairman of the Abuja branch of Nigerian Society of Engineers. Everything that has a beginning, the same must have an end. I want to seize this opportunity to congratulate you and your team for an impactful tenure of office from 2022 to 2024. When the representative of the, the chairman of today's event was making his remarks, he alluded, he made reference to some of the project and program that you've gotten yourself involved in. I must have to congratulate you, my brother, Engineer Ben O.C. Oko, in a very special way. I want to congratulate you for being a great ambassador of Enugu State. We are truly proud of you. We are truly proud of you, O.C. Keep it up, even in your future endeavors. Make us proud. Continue to make Enugu State proud. Thank you. And therefore, please, ladies and gentlemen, it is on this note that I wish to, um, to I want to wish every participant uh, a fruitful week ahead. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, the Executive Governor of Enugu State. Please give him another round of applause. I want to thank each and every one of us for our time so far. We'll be rounding off in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to call up the Chairman of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Abuja Branch, for a quick presentation. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. And I want to also thank my governor for honoring me with his presence today. I, the first encounter I had with the governor was a year before he became governor. I was traveling to Enugu and he was traveling to Lagos. We met at the airport and we spoke extensively about his um, campaign and the what he was going to bring on board. And since then, we've remained in contact. And uh, I remember him sending me messages to congratulate me on what we are doing in Abuja and what, when I became also the chairman. On behalf of the branch, please, my respected honorable commissioner, take our felicitation to the governor, tell him that also we are proud of the engineering feats he has achieved. I think he has won three major national awards for, I think, best governor of the year for his um, great achievements as governor since he came in. Congratulations once again to him. So on this note, we are making presentations. And the first, interestingly, will be to my governor. As a <laughs> As the special guest of honor, it's my honor to invite my Oga, the immediate past executive secretary of FCDA engineer, Omar Gamboji Brin, to make this presentation on behalf of the branch to His Excellency Barista Peter Ndubisimba, the governor of Enugu State. Thank you very much, uh, my chair. I used to be like Ben way back in uh, 2001, uh, 2003, sorry. I'm missing the dates again. I happen to be the 10th chairman of this branch, 2003 to 2005. 
So it's really indeed a pleasure to be given this opportunity to do this presentation to His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Enugu State, Barrister Peter Ndubusi Mba. Personally, I've also been watching what he's doing. And uh, as a professional, I agree with what the commissioner has said. And I think we all want to congratulate him and wish him well. You said he's going to do how many roads in eight years? I can see the I can see the the jump. The two terms are guaranteed. <laughs> so you can I think it's a it's a very good uh, you. you know. And so on behalf of the Nigerian Society of Engineers Abuja branch, I wish to make this presentation to His Excellency for the good job he's doing in Enugu State. Congratulations. I invite our guest speaker, Engineer Sadiq Maibonu, to come and receive his plaque of appreciation. Incidentally, I've heard about uh, Engineer Sadiq, but I didn't meet him until today. I have worked closely with his brother, Alan Bashir Maibong, who was the immediate past, uh, or he was chief of staff to the Honorable Minister of FCT, Alan Mohammed Musabello, when I was executive secretary. So I know who I spoke about you. It's really my pleasure to meet you here personally today and uh, to wish you well. I will join in making sure that the collaboration you are asking for from the Society of Engineers, but in particular, I want to be selfish, in the Federal Capital Territory, <laughs> and FCDA in particular. I'm not there, I've left three years ago, but right, yes. we'll do our best to make sure that we take opportunity to yes. make the progress in development of Abuja, you know, to benefit in this synergy and the issue of energy, uh, problems and issues in our state and the federal. Thank you so very much and congratulations on behalf of the Nigerian Society of Engineers for this very wonderful presentation. I thank you so very much again. say something quickly. So um, the role of engineering in energy transition is one aspect, but I hear partnership and synergy. And Nigerian Institute of Architects came up here. And I know that there's something called sustainable architecture, the energy efficiency in buildings, etc. is all part of the energy transition as well. So I see already an opportunity for that synergy between the architects, the town planners, the Nigerian Institute of Engineers. Thank you very much. <laughs> engineer, I think yours is equally very, very well conducted. And on behalf of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Abuja branch, for the way you took the panel session, there's nothing we can say than to thank you very, very immensely for the good job and wish you well. 
and any further interaction with the society. Congratulations. Mr. Dayo, it's my pleasure to really present this plaque on behalf of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Abuja branch, for the wonderful job you did as a panelist, uh, listening with rapt attention, and I'm sure whatever you espoused will be taken home by every one of us. Congratulations. His regulator, you know, he has to. If he doesn't receive on behalf of his regulator, there may be problems. And I assure Engineer Amara that we will not allow that problem to come. <laughs> so, on behalf of the Society of Engineers Abuja, we will wish to present this to Engineer Joseph Gian Musa for his role in the panel this morning. Congratulations. To capture him. And we finally <laughs> captured you. And After they, putting you on the spot. <laughs> 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 thank you very much on behalf of the Nigerian Society of Engineers. I want to acknowledge it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to our guest speaker and all of our panelists. Thank you all for being here. Thank you once again for your time. We're rounding up now as I bring up to the stage the chairman of the planning committee, engineer ASY Kutigi. Please give him a round of applause. And he's coming up to give us the vote of thanks. Can you applaud him better? He's done a fantastic job and he deserves an applause. Thank you. Thank you very much, the chairman, the president of the Nigerian Society of Engineers, the elders all here, uh, the guest speaker of the day. We wish, and I'm very sure you will not turn it down. We'll find a time to bring you back and your team again, God's willing. It is very important when we are talking of energy transition, we may take it the way we want it to be, but it's almost 97% engineering. There is no need of dragging it. The remaining one can only be marketing and all this. So if you don't have anything to sell, will you go to market? The answer is no. So it is key. Thank you very much for coming, and we pray that Allah will leave us beyond now and witness more and more and more of this gathering. Engineer Ben Osi Oko FNSC, you have proven to be a true leader. You have led us in the past two years, and we are very sure and hopeful that you continue to be in the lead while we follow suit. In Abuja branch, we obey the role of leadership and also the role of shared leadership. We will continue to uphold to that spirit and we wish everybody who 
come here today, a safe journey back to your various destinations, and also we look forward to see you in the football field at uh, Area 3 Sport Complex. We are still tapping the ladder little by little. Also tomorrow is another event. We would like to see you all in that event in respect of our chairman. Thank you very much. Okay. So as soon as we're done from here, uh, as soon as we close this event officially, we'll be going for commissioning of a project at uh, Durumi 2. So please do not go as soon as our a special guest exits, please every other person should wait behind as we move together in a convoy for the commissioning. On that note, I would like to humbly request that we all rise for the national anthem and the closing prayer. National anthem, please. Standing, we'll take the closing prayer, which is the third stanza of the national anthem. O God of cre all creation, grant this our one request. Help us to build a nation where no man is oppressed, and so with peace and plenty, Nigeria may be blessed. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us. We'll take group photograph right after this. Thank you so much. My name is Faith Oche and it was an absolute pleasure to have you all present at this event. Thank you very much.